I still have passion for the mafia. And I think I'm part of the good, the bad, and certainly the ugly. In my time, in the heydays, there was bodies all over the place. When you make a mistake, I'm gonna be the last face you see. It's not the guy who pulls the trigger you gotta worry about, it's the guy who plans it. What are the biggest differences between you and Gotti? I did so many things for this guy. I rigged the trials. I threatened people. I fucking bribed people. And he turns on me. Doesn't history repeat itself? What if Sammy takes me out? What do you want me to be? I'm a gangster. How trigger. do you call the shots on who shoots? Look at the whole fucking picture. You don't think this guy's got balls? You want me to tell this kid to go back and kill Don King? It's all greed. It's all about money. What do you know about what happened with John F. Kennedy? This is going to sound fucking crazy, I think. Are you following any of the Epstein stuff? There isn't even a word for this piece of shit. Teddy Atlas said you went up to him to want to train with him boxing. Teddy Atlas is an asshole. Take away guns from all the good people. I will always have a gun. If I die tomorrow, this was my choice, my life. You still trust people? It's in every book, every movie. It shocked the whole world, what I did. No regrets. So the last time Sammy Dubois Gravano did an exclusive interview was with Diane Sawyer on primetime TV back on April 16, 1997. Sammy's known as the hitman's hitman. He was the underboss to the leader of Gambino family, John Gotti. Sammy, thanks for making an attempt to do this interview. It's my pleasure. So Sam, a lot has changed since uh, 1997. We now have uh, social media. We now have smartphones. We now have everybody having a camera. A lot's changed in America. We have a Donald Trump as a president. So America's changed, world's changed. Has Sammy Dubul Gravano changed? To an extent. I mean, I didn't change much like people would think. I'm more coming out into a legitimate business and going into Hollywood, into a certain things that I'm doing with my life now. I've changed my life. I still have passion for the mafia, from where it came from, how it started, how it existed. It's part of my heritage. It's not just a gang to me. I was in a gang when I was young, but this isn't a gang. This was part of my heritage. It started in Sicily in the 12th century. It fled to the United States. Now, when I said it fled, it didn't come here because they liked the United States. They were running away from Mussolini and fascism. Mm. And it made them come to the United States. And they landed in the United States and everything that they were taught in Italy, they brought them here. So I have a different feel for it. Now there's some stuff that's ugly that we did, and I think I'm part of the good, the bad, and certainly the ugly. But I did this because of my belief in Gozen Austria. I've changed my ways and I've moved on with my life, and I'm going in a different direction. Even sitting here talking to you, that's something that you're not supposed to do in Gozen Austria. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to talk about it. When you flip or cooperate, whatever you want to call it, you're allowed to do whatever you want because you already broke the golden rule by cooperating. So, but if you didn't flip, then you're not allowed to do this because giving up our secrecy, we're a secret society and a brotherhood. And if you give up the secrets, there's no different than taking the stand or doing whatever. You can't give up the secrets of Gozen Austria. Even some of the things that John Gotti did running as boss and people cheer about what he was doing, he did more damage to Gozen Ostra with being out there and putting it on Front Street than 10 cooperating witnesses put together. You believe that? Oh, absolutely. Why do you believe that? Most of the real gangsters believe that and know that. I've got 22 years in prisons. I bunked into a lot of guys. And I bunked into people and I said, listen, you were in a regular prison. Now you're in a witness unit. Tell me the truth. What were they saying about me? You were with this guy and this guy and this guy. This guy, Bobby, he was the underboss in Boston. And he told me, Sammy, you want to know the truth? I hear more crying and complaints about John than you. The position he put you in, and he betrayed you. 
When he betrayed you like that, it was the same as a rat move. In other words, government is trying to put us away. That's their job. Your job as John Gotti is not to put me away. And if that's the role you're gonna take so you can get out and I can take the weight, that's a rat move. What happened between me and John, so I did what I did and, uh, and now I'm going into a whole different thing. That's all behind me. I see what they do now. I think they're pretty smart now. They went away from violence. They don't do that as much anymore. When I was in my time in the heydays in the 70s and 80s, there was bodies all over the place by every different family. But today they don't do that. Does it work without violence and structure though? Isn't a, a part of uh, the leverage to impose fear? It could be, but it doesn't have to be. Fear could be in a, in a whole bunch of ways. Let's say you're a made guy, you're a friend of ours. A friend of ours is a made guy. Okay. You're a friend of ours. So you're not gonna abide by the rules. But you're not too worried because I'm not gonna kill you. But I could chase you. I could get out to all five families. He's no longer a friend of ours. Don't treat him like that. You're thrown out. Now that's a big hit. So you lose your power and nobody will respect you. Nobody will sit with you. Nobody will recognize you. Sometimes in certain cases, it may even be better to, to be dead. It's a good punishment. But the effect of not killing, when I was around, every family had a squad of FBI agents who worked on them, each family. The squad consisted of a 20 some odd agents working on your family. From what I hear now, they're down to three. They used all those extra agents to terrorists and 13, drug gangs, stuff that warrants it. So by them not killing, they don't have the pressure. And then the RICO law and the laws are crippling. So me, you, and another guy, we all trust each other and we go on a murder. Now, the way the law is set, you get convicted on a murder, is life without parole. Every one of us have a get out of jail card free. Of course, we killed Joe Blow. I get pitched for drugs later. And I'm facing 20 or 25 years. I'm 50 years old. Mm. I don't want to do it. So I call the government, me, you, and this other guy, we killed him. They don't trust each other no more because the sentences are so big in most cases that guys flip. Some guys don't want to go to jail. Some guys are screwed when they go to jail. You know, I've heard so many stories with guys, black guys, Hispanic guys, who stood up and got sentenced and were doing their time. What did the people do? They took his money while he was gone. They screwed his wife. They did this, they did that. You're begging for this guy to cooperate. He didn't cooperate. And you do these things to him, so he flips. Or you sold him out in some capacity, and he flips, like I did. When John, John told me to my face at the end of the time, he said, Sammy, the tape's horrible. They sound, make you sound like a monster. What are we gonna do? So I'm controlling all the lawyers. You're gonna take the weight. The, the, the lawyers are gonna bring it out in court that you're a monster. You killed all these people, took over the unions, took over businesses, which I never did. During the trial, the lawyers will say, you hear John complaining on the tapes. Poor John Gotti. He lost control of this monster, Sammy the Bull. It's him, it's not John. So I will go free and you'll do the time. I said, are you sure that's what you want me to do? In other words, I, I, I worry about the feds trying to put me away. I've been pinched all my life, I've faced that. I never faced my friend, my co-defendant, wanting to put me away. That's what they're doing, John. Is that what you really want to do? It has to be done. The streets needs me, the boss. You're the sacrificial lamb. I said, okay, you're sure. But that's the way it is. And I got in touch with the FBI. I flipped and I was gone. That's when I did my first bid of five years. Then I was out for a while, five years. And I went back in on a 20 year sentence. And that sentence, when I started that sentence, I did 17 years, seven months on that sentence. The first six and a half years, I did in the hole. And I got sick in the hole. It took my teeth away, nails, it pre-aged my skin, most of my hair was lost. And there were reports, he's dying of cancer, he's dying of Hashimoto's disease. He, all these different things were coming out. But I survived it. And I'm back out and I'm making my life again. Look who I am. I'm sitting with you talking. It's interesting. But going back, uh, what I'd want to do is pre even this, 
I'm curious to know about the Sammy growing up. Like, you growing up in a family in Brooklyn, your mom, your dad, two sisters, I think you're the youngest of three. Right. Who was Sammy growing up? What was your personality like, even at 10 years old, 12 years old? I'm not even talking 16 in high school with the incident of you and your principal, you know, you punching him in the face. Who were you at eight years old? Who were you at 10 years old? I think I was just like any other kid. I was dyslexic. Right. I was a very slow learner with books, not visual things or hearing things, but with books, stuff like that. The number three looked like an eight, so I was always wrong. So as soon as the teacher said, what number is that? Now, if it looked like an eight to me, I would say three. You're right. Not because I was right, but because I was wrong so many times. So an eight, I knew it wasn't eight, it was three. And vice versa. And I, I hung out with kids. And I grew with kids. I mean, just like any other kid. My father was a painter. Then he got lead poisoning and he couldn't paint. There was used to be lead in the, in the paint. My mother was a seamstress. So she was so good at it, she worked in a factory in New York for a Jewish contractor. She used to make the dresses for the models that they were gonna show the thing and sell it. So the contractor told her, Katie, her name was Kay and they called her Katie. Why don't you open up a small little factory? You're great at this. So she talked to my father. He couldn't paint no more. So they opened up a small little factory together. They knew all the Italian people, all them ladies from Italy who was here. They all knew how to sew. And they all went in there and sewed, and they had a little dress factory. And then we used to go in and help from time to time. And I wasn't the youngest of three. I was the youngest of five. My brother died, and one of my sisters died mm -hmm. before I was even born. Mm -hmm. And who was left was two sisters. One was nine years older than me, one was five years older than me. Did that feeling of you not getting A3, you know, I see this, dyslexic, did that create any rage in you? Like, I'm a little bit different, why am I being treated this way, or not at all? No, no, there was plenty of rage. There was plenty of Absolutely. rage. Absolutely. Since I got what left age? back in the fourth grade. Okay. I don't even know how old you're supposed to be in the fourth grade, but I got left back in the fourth grade. So now when I go forward, they're, they're younger than me. And the teacher would say a, a certain word, a big word, ask somebody to spell it. I was in the back of the class all the time. And another kid to spell another word. They would get to me and say, okay, Gravano, spell cat. The whole class would giggle. I was so ashamed and rage I felt. After school, I beat the shit out of everybody. I was actually older and bigger than them. And I was a strong kid. I beat the shit out of all of them. There was no more laughing. When I hit the seventh grade, I got left back again. And at that point I said, school's not for me, just not for me. And I hardly went. I used to play hooky all the time. And one day that's how that thing started with it. And the teacher, I got caught by truant officers who went around and caught kids playing hooky. And I was a little drunk. They brought me up to the principal. I was sitting in the principal's office and he was talking to the principal. And he was saying, this is what they are. The upbringing isn't there. He used the word greaseball. It's a slur, a racist slur against mm -hmm. black Italian people. That didn't bother me too much. But when he was saying what kind of people these people are, this is a result, these kind of kids. So I, at one point I got up and said, this has nothing to do with my mother and father, the hardworking people. This has to do with me. He said something about my mother and father. Again, I cracked him a shot. I broke his jaw and I was thrown out of school. Months later, in front of the Board of Education, I was transferred to another school, McKinley Junior High School. It was in a different neighborhood, mostly Irish, Polacks. The Irish and the Italian didn't get along at all. I wasn't a bad looking kid. I got along with the girls, but not the boys. Every day I was in a fight, in trouble. Finally, I get thrown out of that school too. I did find a teacher in that school who really tried to help me, a Mr. Mindrakia. I respected this guy. He knew I wasn't stupid. He just knew I had a learning problem. Matter of fact, he would even tell me, if you get frustrated, you want to walk out of the class, walk out. And I got to respect this guy a lot. And I actually wanted to make him look good. So I was trying to hang in, but I flunked that school and I was sent to 600 school. And that is all misfits. I was in that school. I think it was the first week, there was a guy sitting in front of me, he was dressed in, looked like a robe. And I said something funny, the class was laughing. 
and he tapped his book, his Bible, on my head, on my forehead. You shouldn't do this, and you're acting, you're the devil. After about the third or fourth time, he hit me on the head, and when he was talking, I hit him and knocked his ass out. I was thrown out again of 600 school. The Board of Education called me. I was under 16. They said, he's out, suspended. On his 16th birthday, you can come here and sign him out. We never want him back in regular school. And if you don't, we're going to put him in reform school. So the next step was, it's like a kid's jail. So my mother and father kept me out when I was 16. They went there and signed me out. So I felt rage. But what I felt, I felt and I saw the pain in their face. Like they want their son to be successful or do something. And I, I, it broke their heart. They never hit me. My mother hit me with brooms and mops and whatever. But my father never hit me. Family of love. They loved you. They, they loved me. They, they adored me. I was the only boy. I was a little boy. My sisters were older. They would take me. To, you know, they almost acted like a mother. One of them is five years older. One's nine years older. They're much older than me. Hmm. Then I found a gang, the Rampers, a street gang, just like any other gang, I guess. Tough kids. We got together and fought and stole and did things. And to us, it was the right thing. We were doing the right thing. We were even helping our families who were broke. At this point, you're what, 17 years old? No, I'm even, I'm, I'm in, in a gang, I'm 14. Oh, 14, you're in a gang. 14, 15. Got it. So typically when somebody joins a gang, there's something missing in the house. Not a father figure or something like that, right? But you have love, your mom hit you, your dad didn't hit you, typically it's the other way around. We'll forgive mom because it's mom. What could have been done to prevent Sammy Gravano from becoming underboss Sammy Dubo Gravano. Could the system or anything been done to prevent it and squashed it right there and Sammy goes a different direction with his life? Or I don't do think, think so. Okay. I don't think so. First of all, my neighborhood was entrenched. If you see the movies Goodfellas and all those, it was entrenched with street mafia people. Now, we weren't in the mafia at that age. We're together, where is the mm -hmm. ramp is, fuck them and everybody else. We don't want to have nothing to do with them, but it's entrenched. After a while, they're, they're my idols, when, especially at 17, and you look up to these people. If you didn't look up to them or you went overboard in some way, you got killed in those days. Mm. There was bodies all over the place back then. So whether you liked the guy or didn't like the guy, you knew your place to get away from him. You know, I'll give you an example. One time, my father tells me in the dress factory, he's gonna ship clothes tomorrow. He wants me to come in and help him clip some threads, put plastic over the dresses that they're gonna to ship tomorrow. I'm in the back doing that. I see these two big guys come in and they're cursing at my father about the union. They're union guys and he's non-union. And they're cursing, they're abusing the shit out of him. My father doesn't even look like it's phasing him, like nothing's happening. They walk out and I said, who are they? He says, the union people, don't worry about it. I said, what do you mean? They, they said they're gonna come back tomorrow and if you don't strain this out, you, you don't have money, they're gonna beat you up, they're gonna do this, they'll break your legs. He says, don't worry about it. My gumbada, Suvido, he'll t I talk to him, he'll take care of this. They got big mouths, don't worry about it. Don't do nothing. So I went back to the gang that night and told my friends. This guy Jerry Papa was the head of our, the leader of the gang, and I told him. So I said, I'm gonna take a couple of guys, we go in with me in the factory. When they come back, if they raise their hands, we're gonna break every bone in their body. So Jerry opens up his jacket and he says, Sammy, nah, forget about fighting. Look, he's got a gun. He says, if they raise their hands to your father, kill them. Give us a call. We'll come and get rid of the bodies and the gun and everything. Don't worry about it. Now, I never killed anybody. I never even thought of killing somebody. I was physical with my hands. I took the gun and I put it under my belt. If they raise their hands to my father, I'm gonna kill them. So I go there, and the next day they come in. I'm ready. They turn around and they tell my father, why didn't you tell us that Suvido is your gumbada? Why didn't you tell us, Jerry? And they're talking sweet to him. If you have any problems with anybody, give us a call. They're giving them their card. Give us a call, we'll take care of you. You could stay non-union, don't worry about it and they leave. So I come out, I said, Dad, what the hell was that? What are they talking about, Suvido? Now I knew the guy, because he was my father's gumbada. 
He was smaller than my father and he was this big, this thin. A good wind could knock him on his ass. What the hell are these big six, two, six, three guys? What are they worried about him? I didn't understand the mafia. Right. So my father says, I told you. We honest people, we work. If we have trouble, we go to people like Suvido and they take care of these problems. Don't, don't be excited. So I said, well, that wouldn't happen. I would have took care of this. How would you take care of these people? And I opened up my shirt and I showed him the gun. My father, it was the first time I thought he was gonna hit me. He flipped out. Give me that gun, we don't do that. I told you, we're legitimate people. That's the kind of people he was. Sammy, are you alpha or is your dad alpha? Like, you know, just because it's a dad doesn't mean one is a bigger alpha than the other one. Did you have more of an alpha spirit than him? Oh, I'm much more of an alpha than him. You're much more than him. So let me ask you, how much of you becoming who you became has to do with your environment and how much of it has to do with your DNA and your wiring and the way you're born? Environment, experiences, teacher, eight, three, dyslexic, bullying, punching a principal versus your DNA, your wiring. I believe it's the neighborhood, the environment is, is one thing. I don't think it's my DNA. If there was help in schools, I could have graduated. I, I got out of the eighth grade. That was my last day in school. I never even went to high school. I ran unions and businesses all over New York and shocked the whole world, what I did. It's in every book, every movie. I've met with lawyers and dealt with lawyers. When I look at them, I say, my God, what do, you, what do you have? The lexic, how, what'd you do? In other words, you went to school, you passed some tests. He's dumber than wood. I think I'm smarter than him. So I don't think I can't learn. I sit down and I've done businesses all day long. I just got out of prison, not even two years. September will be two years. Mm. I'm sitting down going forward in Hollywood. I'm working on a podcast, a lot of content about my life. It's not an easy thing to get to that point. I'm working on a book, a possible scripted show down the road. And I sit down with businessmen all the time. I sit down with guys, producers and heavyweights in Hollywood. And they say, a couple of them told me, Sammy, you're talking, you talk like a gangster. You're rough talking, you curse a little bit, you talk rough, but you're super fucking smart. You're coming up, you just got into this industry and you're making moves and talking with people like you've been here a hundred years. So I told him, when your kids are born, make sure they're dyslexic, and they'll, they'll be good too. But I, could, I have enough brains. I related to, when I watch the news and I, all the time, these kids who go around shooting people, the news asks a million questions, just like you asked. Why? How come? We go, gun control. What's guns got to do with it? Now, I'm put my criminal hat on. Go ahead, do gun control. Take away guns from all the good people I will always have a gun. Every criminal will always have a gun. It doesn't come from different states, it could come from different countries. And if you were, probably when you were younger, you heard the thing, a zip gun, they can make a gun. I, we made silencers. So that's not gonna help nobody. What it's gonna do is a girl is home with her kids, some guy is stalking her, he wants to rape her, but he's always questioning, if I kick that door in, to protect her kids and herself, she might have a gun and blow my head off. But take away all of that protection. She's gonna get slaughtered. What about how many times did people with legitimate guns save so many people or stop somebody who's completely out of their mind? This is a problem of people growing up. The first problem at home. We all know our kids, our own kids. You know if the kid's a little weird or he's a little upset and he's not thinking right, you know it. But nobody will ever call the cops or anybody on their kids. They feel like they're giving their kids up. It's just normal reaction. They, he's gonna be great. You wait and see, he'll, he'll change. He gets worse. So now he goes to school. The teachers see it, but there's so many laws and rules. If the teacher says, I'm gonna send Jimmy to psych, the family will sue, He'll, she'll, you'll get fired. So you're tying the hands of teachers. So this kid just goes and goes and goes. By the time he goes out and shoots, God forbid, 14 people, there's always a line of people saying, yeah, when you look back, I, I knew this kid would be the worst, but nobody ever said nothing or did nothing. That's environment. 
That's not Dilexa, that's not a slow liner because the school system should never, if I wouldn't have been called Dilexa, or if they would have known how to treat it, I don't know what I would have been. I might have been a doctor, I might have been a lawyer, I really don't know. Oh, so you do believe you could have gone a different direction if somebody got a hold of you early? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so this is so- Absolutely. Got it, so you did say there was environment, but now you're saying if somebody worked with you, tutored you, developed you, maybe you would have gone a different direction. Absolutely, I'm saying the same thing now about these kids who shoot people. If you would have grabbed those people years ago right. and said, there's a problem with this kid, let's tutor him. Let's send him to special places. Let's take care of hmm. him. Maybe that kid, when he's 16, 18, 21, whatever the hell he is, he won't be shooting all these people. The kid is bent. It's not the gun. Now, if you took all the guns away and one of these kids run into a disco and he cuts loose with a bomb, instead of shooting 14 people, 60 people are dead. Are you happy? He don't have a gun. What are you gonna say then? Oh, we shouldn't have bombs? Of course we shouldn't have bombs. But it's the kid, we're never going to the problem. And they always ask this stupid question, what can we do? How can we stop it? You can't, the guy is nuts. Even gangs, street gangs, the mafia, they don't run around shooting innocent people. We shoot each other when we break rules. We don't run around shooting innocent people. People will tell you live in tough neighborhoods, Italian neighborhoods for years ago. The mafia was actually a safe place for them. They didn't allow a rapist or a child molester. I'll give you an example. I'm in front of my place, I hang out, and there's this beautiful woman. She had a baby, now she's back in shape. She's drop dead gorgeous, and she's walking. She walks right past where we stay. We're sitting outside with beach chairs talking. It's not like the movies, people hooting and howling, maybe on a construction crew, but we don't do that. I tell my people, you do that, this is our people, this is our neighborhood. Don't do that. If I hear you doing something, no, Sam, we know we ain't gonna do that. So you'd say to yourself, she knows she's dropped that gorgeous. Why is she walking right past us on our side of the street? You know the answer? She feels safer? Absolutely. She don't want to walk on the other side because people will not hoot now. She's liable to get raped or robbed or something. And when I say the other side, it could be around the block. She's comfortable here. She knows she's not gonna get hurt. Her husband allows her. Yeah, go on 18th there, go right past them. Stay by them. Because we wouldn't allow nothing to happen to her. There's a different vibe. I mean, even though they're, you know, like people say, he's a killer. He was involved in 19 murders. I was involved in three mafia wars. I was involved in two different families. You could say whatever you want to say. But the reality is like, what do we do to stop this? Change the environment. Change the kid who's sick coming up. Change the kid who's dyslexic. Do something to help these intervene then. Years ago, they, there was when I was a kid growing up, there was mental institutions. Then they took them away. There's no mental institutions. I heard Trump saying, we better start building them again. You bet your sweet ass you should, you should start building them again. Put people in there, not to do time, but to rehabilitate them, to help them. Look what we have in cities. We have zones where it's safe for, for people who are committing crimes. There's so many stupid laws that it's pathetic. It's tying the hands of everybody and it's deteriorating the country. So you're for Second Amendment? Oh, absolutely. That would be an understatement. And this is uh, coming from a former underboss who for the criminal, if they banned guns, they would have an edge. And you're saying to keep the guns is gonna keep the citizens safer. Absolutely. Listen, how many shootings are there? 10, 20, 30? There's 300 and something million people in this country. Mm. The, the numbers just don't jive. And, and there, how many guns are out there? They say 200 million guns. So you had 30 shootings. I mean, that's nothing. How many car accidents did you have? How many drunken drivers killed people? How many? Do we take cars away? We try and control the person who's drinking and driving. We have to control the people who are gonna have guns. Listen, I'm for the Second Amendment, but I do think, on the other hand, looking at it the other way, I used to go hunting. I would shoot a rifle, that was a bolt action, I missed the deer. I bolted again, boom, missed the deer, he got away. They have guns now that shoot a 100 bullets 
with a semi-automatic like a machine gun. So in 10 seconds, he could unload 200 bullets. Do you need 200 bullets to kill a deer? No. So they could limit some of that power. Mm. Those, and I was in the military, so those are military guns, a 30 caliber, the thing you knock half of your body off when you get hit. What do you need a 30 caliber for? Why do they need a, a 30 caliber? You need a gun to protect your house. 38, a handgun, a shotgun, a gun that it, with a bolt that only shoots one at a time is fine. You can protect your family. She can protect herself. So I, I, I agree with that. There's too much power. And when you get a nut and you give him that much power, then you, you're waiting for something major to happen. So you leave 16, 17 years old, and you go in the military, you become a corporal in the U.S. Army. I think you serve two years honorable discharge. You go to Fort Jackson, uh, South Carolina. You're working as a, I think as a cook, was your MOS. Then you get out. How did you get introduced to Colombo? And then how did you go from there to Gambino? Well, I was introduced by, as soon as I got out of the Army at 21, I wasn't a cook. I was a uh, uh, communications. I worked in the kitchen and had a problem in the kitchen one time, and it involved racism. There was a black guy serving, and I was serving next to him on the line, and a couple of hillbillies came by. I knew, I knew about racism, but not like this. I saw it in South Carolina. It was a whole different level. I never saw it like this. So when he went to him, the black guy right in front of me, he's calling him, boy this, boy that, go get that, boy. Give me more, boy. And I'm listening. Black guy was a pretty strong looking guy. He didn't seem to phase him not. Didn't bother him not. And then the guy came to me. He started with me. Because they look at, I came from New York. Hey boy, fill my tray. So I got this long metal spoon. I'm filling this, the compartment with the beans or whatever it was. And it's starting to drip over. So I stop. And he looks at me and he says, he throws everything on the counter. And he said, boy, when I tell you whoop it on me, you whoop it on me. And he's got an empty tray and he puts it back out. Whoop it on me, huh? And I whack him with the spoon in the head. And he goes flying back. But I wasn't all that smart because the next two guys were his friends. And his friend hits me with a tray. And I go flying backwards a little bit. And the black guy from the Bronx, we were friendly. He jumps over the thing and he starts throwing punches. I get back over. The whole place is in the half we're fighting like crazy. So we're sitting, the MPs come, we're sitting on the floor, me and the black guy, and uh, a sergeant comes, he's 78, something like that. He's in charge of the MPs, and he's a big black guy. And he looks at me and he said, you like helping black people, boy? He thinks that I jumped in to help him, but it was the other way around. But I'm not a jerk, I was gonna take advantage of it. I said, well, that's what you do, I'm from New York. I, I don't believe in this bullshit. And he winks at me, so I know I'm not in trouble. And I'm never online again. I'm in the back with him, peeling potatoes when we come on. So that's what I was. But I, in the Army, I was in communications. So when I get out, I get out at 21. I'm right back in the rampers. Not even one day goes by. I go to the family, and I go right to the rampers. Two years, I'm back. And then at the age of 23, a friend of mine, Tommy Spiro, says his uncle Shorty Spiro, his name was Tommy as well, wants to see me. And I, he's a heavyweight guy. He's in the Colombo family, he's very well known, a heavyweight. He was in the original Gallo War. So I meet with him and he says, listen, I hear a lot of good things about you. I know a lot of things about you. You're gonna get killed. He said, you're too damn tough. You don't wanna listen. You can't run around, you're not hooked up. You gotta hook up with people. I would like you to be with me. I will never lie to you. I will never backstab. Whatever I asked you to do, I already did. It was music to my ear. He says, in my crew, you're gonna be part of my family. I joined up. I went with him. I started having trouble with Carmine Persico. Not trouble, I, he, would, he was using me to do things. Give this guy a beating, do this, do that. And I was doing all those things. Now, his brother, Ralph Spiro, wanted to put his son in. So he has an argument with Shorty. Why do you keep bringing Sammy to Junior? And he said, listen, bro, I don't bring him there. Junior's asking for him to come down. When he tells me, and I bring him down. So a lot of jealousy, 
on behind my back. I didn't know that was happening. And uh, at one point, there was a guy with us, Ralphie Ronda. He went on a, a stick up with another crew. And uh, he gets into a, a gun battle with three or four detectives. And he gets hit 11 times and dies. I'm in Ships at Bay in a you know, dark, dingy, bullshit bar, talking to the old man, Johnny Rizzo, who's a main guy, and a couple of other people, Louis Melito, my Gumbada Alley boy, and a few other people. We're talking, and this beautiful looking blonde comes in, short skirt, high heels, big blonde hair. In those days, I used to tease it. It's, and she comes in with a guy, well built guy. And they sit at the other end of the bar. Very dark, Johnny. You could hardly see them. I mean, you see them, but you can't recognize who they are. The old man Rizzo tells me, he says, Sammy, I think this girl uh, is trying to make a play for you. She's eyeballing you. I think he's breaking my chops because we always break each other's chops with things. So I said, come on, John. She's sitting with a guy. We're going to talk. We're going to wind up in a, in a fight. Come on, stop. And we keep talking. Louis Melito tells me, Sammy, I don't think he's breaking your chops. She's looking at you every two seconds. What are you, are you stupid you don't see it? I can hardly see her. So how do you know she's, she's looking this way? How do you know she's looking at me? She's looking at you. All of a sudden, a guy gets up and goes to the bathroom. And she gets up and starts walking towards us. Rizzo hits me in the, in the back. I told you, go over and see what she wants. So I walk over, and who is it? I'm about as close as I am to you. It's Ralph V. Ronga's wife. He's dead a, a week and a half. I look at her, and I, she didn't have that hair like that. She never looked like that to me. And I said, what are you doing? Your husband just died. Who's this guy? She said, Sammy, life goes on. Life goes on. He's not even fucking cold yet. You can't wait a while? She says, I see the way you used to look at me. Maybe I could get rid of him. Maybe me and... What? Get the fuck away. I, I went into a rage with her. She got terrified. She left. The guy left. When the guy came out, we told him. He said, what's the matter? Get her and get out while you can. Go. So he did. The next day, she went to Ralph and told Ralph. So Ralph takes this as a thing. This is he's going to undermine me. He don't know there's all them people there. He's going to make up a story that I try to make her. She wouldn't go with me, and I'm abusing her. He calls my wife and tells my wife, Junior, come my Persico, is going to kill your fucking husband. He tried to make Ralphie Ranga's wife. He's dead, and he hangs up on my wife. My wife really is not a, a typical gangster's wife. I come home, she's hysterical crying. What did you do? What are you talking about what I did? What, what did I do? What are you crying about? And she says, you tried to make Ralphie's wife? What are you, crazy? Who told you that? Ralph called me and told me. And she told me everything he said. So I said, Dad, listen to me, baby. Stop crying. This life is so technical. Make sure that every word you tell me is exactly right. Tell it to me again. If there's anything wrong, we're through. She tells me the same story, she can't even stop crying. I go inside, I go in the drawer, I get a gun, I get in my car and I go to Ralphie's house. I go to the door and we were like good fellas. We all lived together. So Ann, his wife, comes to the door. Hey Sammy, what's up? I says, I had taken out the gun. I had it by my, the back, by my ass. As Soon as he came to the door, I was gonna kill him. Right in front of Ann and I was so hot. She says, did something go wrong? Ralph took off an hour or two ago. Is there a problem? No, there's no problem. Just tell him I was here. So when I went to turn to walk, she saw the gun. Mm -hmm. And she told Shorty and Ralph, and he came to the house with a gun to kill Ralph. So there's, I'm gonna supposed to get a tremendous beating. They're gonna set me up. The old man Rizzo comes to me again, found out about it, and said, don't go to this meeting. I said, how could I not go? These are my people. John, this is none of your business. You're in, you're with the Gambinos. It's none of your business. That's what you're going to be told. You can't do nothing for me. She said, well, you got to do something. What do you want me to do, run away? I didn't do nothing. So he stays with me. We go and see Shorty. Shorty gets together and says, listen, John, this is none of your business. But John tells him, listen, it's none of my business. You're right. But I want to tell you what I saw. And he tells him exactly what happened. He said, Louis Melito, who's in the car, you want him to come in? He was there. Ali Boy was with the Genovese people, he was there. Mikey who's with these people, he was there. You want to talk to all of them? 
That's not what happened. Shorty looks at me and says, I knew this fucking kid didn't do that, wouldn't do that. And he gives me a hug and a kiss. He says, go home and don't come out until I let you know. Now, unbeknownst to me, the head of the Columbos, Carmine was in jail, Alley Boy Persico Sr. was the concierge, he was acting boss. And this went to Johnny Rizzo's captain, who was a guy named Tato Arello, right up to Carlo Gambino. And bosses made a decision on what to do. The next day I would get in Tato's car. I, I knew his son, but I never knew him. I knew he was a heavyweight gangster. He was a, he was a captain, a heavyweight. I get in his car and we go down to Carroll Street, downtown Brooklyn. They talk a little bit. Ali Boy Persico calls me on the side. He said, we know the whole thing. I should give you permission to kill Ralph, what he did. He mentioned my brother's name. If you would've got killed, your wife would've thought my brother did it or ordered it. He deserves to get killed for that. But what he did to you, he deserves to be get killed. But I can't tell you to kill him because he shot his brother. We can't do it. So we're gonna reach a conclusion here on what's gonna happen. We're definitely not gonna kill you. You didn't do nothing. And you acted like a fucking man. Were you gonna shoot him when you got to the door? Absolutely. That's why I had the gun out. I was definitely gonna shoot him. They already knew I was a shooter. All right, we can't keep you in this family no more because if we keep this together, it's gonna explode. The Gambinos talk for you. We're gonna release you to the Gambino family with no restrictions. We're always gonna be your friend. You gotta give me one promise that you won't hurt Ralph Spiller. So if that's what the decision is, okay. I turn around and get back in the car with Tato. We're going back. And he says, from here on in, you're with us. You're with me directly. You embarrass me, us. Do anything without my permission, you'll die in this family right away. No questions asked. We went on a limb for you. I says, all right, I want you in my fucking club every day. Sit with me. I'm going to know every time you get a pimple, every time you get laid, no matter what the fuck you do in life, I'm going to know. I'm going to get to know you better than you know yourself. My life starts in the Gambino family. And it's a whole nother story and I can't get into too much. I think I'm getting into too much already. People from the book and the podcast are going to go ape shit on me when they hear this. I, I guess the, the part is though, so now you get in and at what point do you get introduced to Gotti where you and Gotti's relationship starts developing? I don't meet Gotti. Gotti does something and goes to jail for a little while, a couple of years. That guy they shot in a bar. He didn't even shoot him. They, that's what was in the movie, but that's not true. Let me ask you just a question before you go there. I, I, I've heard two stories that Gotti and Junior never killed anybody. From your experiences, did you ever hear about them killing anybody themselves? Not putting a hit on somebody else doing the work, them doing it themselves. I don't think so. I don't, I don't remember if he pulled the trigger, if he didn't pull the trigger. But I'll tell you right now, I would bank on him not being able to shoot you. You and, wouldn't bank on him not being able to shoot yeah, you? Yeah, he shoots oh, you in it. a fucking okay. hot minute like that. I don't know about John Jr., but the, the, uh, the father would kill you in a hot minute. I didn't pull the trigger all the time. I was basically the guy who headed and planned the hit. And I, I, let me tell you really quick how that happened. Tato really got to know me. And he said, Sammy, why are you the, always the front guy in when you go steal? When you go by the alley, boy, you go in, you're the first guy, stick him up, do this, do that. Why are you always the first guy in? So I said, I don't know. That's just the way we do it. And alley boy, my, he's my gumbada. I, he's got my back. He's a tough guy. So he says, listen, I know he's a tough guy, but alley boy's not that smart. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. He's a little, he's dumb as wood sometimes. Okay, so you are smart. He said, you know what happens? You go in, he's taking you back. Something happens, he has to rearrange everything and make things happen so you just get away. And he ain't got the brains. Don't you think it should be the other way around? He goes in first, you have his back. If something happens, you can react like this. He can't. And if he does react like that, it's always going to be something crazy. And I love Ali, boy. I'm not knocking him. He's telling me. And I love him, too. He's my gumbada. He's, my, he's godfather of my daughter. You know, he, he's reactionary. He just reacts. 
He don't think when he reacts. So I said, I never looked at it that way. He said, later on in life, when you go do a hit, it's not the guy who pulls the trigger you got to worry about. It's the guy who plans it. The guy who plans that that guy can't get away, number one. And number two, that you all get away. You're a planner. Go home and look in the fucking mirror. Stop running in first. Think. Use your head. And I thought about it, and he was right. I thought he was 100% right. I more or less did the planning of it. But if you think that I would hesitate, I'm pulling the trigger because I'm the planner and not the actual shooter. And it was said, anybody could shoot a gun. You're pulling the trigger. Interesting. So how many of the 19 did you pull the trigger on? I'm not even going to get into that because it doesn't matter. And there's, by now I'm going to have problems with, with all kinds of victims saying all kinds of things. So I'm not going to get into that. So in your world, calling it means a hit on you, meaning you, that counts as one of your 19. 19 doesn't mean that you oh, any shot. Play, any, any, any role you take. You know what I'm asking here? Yes, this. yes, yes. But any role you take in that murder, you're part of it. Listen, there's a couple of guys sitting here. Okay. Okay? And we're going to hit this guy, this one guy. And you're in on it. This guy's in on it. This guy here, over here, he's going to pull the trigger and shoot him. You're going to do this. You're going to drive a car, a crash car. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And you're sitting in this room right here. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. The attention's got to be around you so we can kill him. Now, a guy comes. He gets up from there and walks over to get a glass of water or something. But instead of getting a glass of water, he shoots him in the head. He blows his brains out. You're sitting right here. You don't think this guy's got balls? Or he's, you know what I mean? Or you take away anything from him. He's part of the hit. Law enforcement don't give a shit what, what you did. You're part of that hit. That's life without parole. You're a hit guy. Mm. But it's your function. What are you going to be? Now, today you might be sitting here. Tomorrow this guy might be sitting there and you're doing that. It don't matter who's pulling the trigger. It's a matter of how does it happen? How does it work where you're not just sloppy in the middle of the streets and you're, it, where it's perfectly done and you get away with it. So, so order, getting away with it 19 times, if you want to. But out of the 19, it's not necessarily that you pull the trigger No, 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 times. no, no. I don't, I don't even think it's important who pulls the trigger. You don't think so? No. Everybody in that room who's on this hit is capable of pulling that trigger. You, I don't want you to be the shooter. Maybe I want this guy to pull the how trigger. How do you call the shots on who shoots? How is that decision made? On how I plan the hit. But what, how do you choose one person over another person? Is it the case and how the relationship is and who's I'll give the you least? an example with a guy named D.B. who got killed. Sure. And a quick example, because I don't want to explain the whole thing. But he's going to come in to a meeting. So we're going to sit at a table just like me and you were sitting. Actually a little close. So he's going to get killed. Now what I do is I tell the old man Joe Peruta who's with me. Joe, get D.B. a coffee. He walks over there. Opens up the cabinet, takes a quick peek, takes out the gun with the silencer, comes up behind you, and hits you, boop, I get splatted. Do you think I'm less than Joe? I couldn't do this? You think this is a less position or a lesser guy? That bullet could hit me too. I'm sitting here. But what makes it work? I don't want to torture the guy. I don't want to wrestle with the guy. I don't even want you to suffer. This is gonna sound fucking crazy, I think. But you're gonna die, you never even knew what the fuck hit you. DB died and had no reaction whatsoever. It's like getting a massive explosion in your body or your heart stops immediately and you're just killed over. That's what it is. So when I do a hit, it's, one, it's clean. And I'm immediately gonna pick him up and put him in a body bag. We're gonna get rid of him so there's not sh stuff all over the place. It's, it's a whole thing. So I'm a professional hit guy. People would say on the street before, just before we got pitched practically, this fucking Samuel Bull's got a contract on you, you're dead. You can't get away from this guy. Why? Because I had blinders on. Like this, the way I'm looking at you now. I don't look at nothing. I don't care about the people who are in this room if there was people. I don't care about my family, my friends, my uncle, my aunt, 
money, nothing. Just you. It's me and you. And I'm going to pick when you're going to die. And it's cold and calculated, and not that cold and calculated. Could you come in here with your wife, with your kid? You're not going to get hit. Not with me. You're not getting hit. We'll get him another time. But I'm, I'm on you like glue. When you make your mistakes, I'm going to be the last face you see. I'm all over you. Why did I get picked 19 times? By bosses. Colombo people actually first, then Paul Castellano, then John Gotti. Why am I being picked? Why am I in three mafia wars? Why are you? I'm fucking good at it. I, I'm what Tato said. I'm a thinker. I'm a planner. I'm not a thug. I'll give you another thug thing. One time Paul Castellano in his house is sitting there and he's talking to us like he always did. All the heavyweights are at the table. All of them. John Gotti, Roy DeMeo, me, everybody. We're all sitting there. And he says, you know, in our life, there's two kinds of guys. There's gangsters who are thugs and there's racketeers who are more like business guys. Very, very rare will you find someone who is both. It's almost impossible when you look around. You're either a th thug or you're a racketeer. He says, we have one in our family. We should be fortunate. You could have heard a pin drop. Everybody's head is turned looking at him. And he said, that guy, and he was, is that Sammy the Bull? He's a thug and a, and a racketeer. My fucking chest came out four inches. My head must have blew up two or three inches. I couldn't believe that I'm being pulled out like that. And when we're leaving, I'm hitting guys on the back. You fucking thug, you're only a thug. I'm both, and I'm breaking chops. I didn't even realize what, what it was. And I thought, this is how my brain works. How did I become a gangster and a racketeer? How is that possible? It's impossible for so many people. How did I become that? I got the lexic. How the fuck did I become both? Stone Cold Killer, you could call me, and a fucking great business guy who could run unions. How did I become both? Now it's my upbringing. What I learned from my father from my mother, from my family. I absorbed that and it never left me. How legitimate, how honest they were. How they never lied, I mean, I, 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 that never left me. Mr. Mandrakia, I'm still mentioning his name fucking 50 years ago. Those things never left me. When I was in a gang, we didn't kill people like they do here. We just fought, fights. When I go into the Colombo family, beat up that guy, rob that, take, hijack that, kill this guy, do this, do that. And now I go into the Gambino family, I'm sitting with Tato, and I'm learning about business, unions, all kinds of things. And I always played around with construction. And I was in businesses, they didn't work, a few of them. Had a fruit and vegetable store, didn't work. But every time my business didn't work, I don't even, never thought I failed in business. I just looked at the business and said, what did I do wrong that other people could have businesses and succeed? What did I do wrong to not succeed? So even when I failed, I won. I, I knew why I failed, and it would help me down the road. I knew that. That's what made me both. Mm. All of those things. That's the highest level of compliment uh, uh, somebody like him can give you to be a, an I think in, in, a, in front of 20 different guys, all captains and everything. Yeah. I mean, I, that's about as high, and I'm, I wasn't a captain, I was an acting captain. Now, how's your relationship at that time? How are you and Gotti doing together, coming up? We're doing fine. I don't really know Gotti, I know of him. I think I was made in 1976. I think he was made in 77. So he was made after me. Gotti was made after you? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So they kept it open for, for how long did they keep oh, it open? Oh, it's for? open for years. It's never okay. really closed. Got it. Got it. So why did they by the, why did why did they close in the first place for 19 years or 18 years? It was more than that. It was from 1955 or something like that, from 1957 to 1975. They closed it because some people were charging money to get made, or some got people it. were putting their sons in there who didn't really belong. I guess they got so frustrated with it, they closed it. And it didn't open no more. Got it. So, so you're in 76, he's in 77, and then how does that relationship uh, uh, get started? Frankie De Chico, I was very close with all my, all my, all my life. Every time he, would, he was a full-blown captain, I, I was made and I was an acting captain. Tato made me his acting captain almost immediately. 
a year later. I would always patronize places that he would open, an after hour club, a crap game, an ass, a gambling. So I would always go and patronize. So I was there and his father, Frankie Chico's father's name was Boozy, was a made guy. He was under title, so was I now. So I was standing at the bar with Boozy, uh, Frankie Chico's father, and the door opened and John Gotti and a few guys walked in his little entourage. So he says, do you know this kid, John Gotti? I said, no, I heard of him. Matter of fact, he helped a friend of mine who was in jail and he did it in a movie. He had a problem with black people and they were gonna hurt him. He heard that the kid was friendly with me. He intervened and straightened the whole thing out. So, and I was telling Boozy, he did something like that. I, I heard, and he says, yeah, there's a lot of good things with him. He's gonna be like us eventually. Mm. But I know he's not a friend, but he's gonna be. And when I say friend, I mean a main guy, when I'm talking to a main guy. He came over to Boozy, he knew Boozy. Hey, Boozy, how you doing? Say, are you Sammy? Sammy, yeah, yeah, I met him. And he says, oh, Sam, I hear a lot of great things. And he told me about my friend that he helped. I said, I heard about that, I appreciate it. I said, give John a drink. I said, I hear a lot of good things about you too, Bo. That's when we met. A little while later, he went in the back where there was a crap game. John was a degenerate gambler. So he went in the back and I stood at the bar with uh, Boozy. That's when I met him in 1977. I didn't grow up with John. I didn't come from that neighborhood. They have me that we don't, we have a, a long relationship. We don't, I'm, a, I'm on a whole other end. I'm Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, Bay Ridge, Bensonhurst. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm in that area. He's in Queens, almost towards Long Island. I'm, it's not my neighborhood. But I did hear about him. I knew he was in the family, but I didn't know, I knew he wasn't made. You know, then he went to the camp for a while. Was he overly ambitious on why he eventually became the boss? Or was it something where everybody around said, no, this is, this is the guy that's got to be the boss eventually after, you know, taking out Paul Castellano? Read my book coming out or do listen to the podcast. It's too long of a story. Give me the shorter version of it. I don't, give me, give me a glimpse of it. I say, it, say it again. Was John Gotti, was he overly ambitious where, like, you know, uh, Frank Collada tells me when he first met Tony Spilatro, he knew eventually Spilatro wanted to be a boss. Like he said it since he was a kid. It was an inspiration to him. Was Gotti so ambitious where he wanted to be a boss eventually? Or was it something where people voted and said, he has what it takes to be a boss? Oh, no, no, no. He, listen, he, 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 wasn't, he didn't have what it takes to be a boss. We made him a boss. But Paul fucked up. He made a lot, a lot of mistakes. I thought the, the world of him in the beginning. He lost my love through a series of events and he lost the respect that Frankie had for him. Paul had made a ton of mistakes prior and there was rumbling, rumbling and growling by us, the troops, whatever. A lot of things, he changed from what he was in the beginning. He got more greedy. He had so much fucking money. It was, how could you be that? How could you be greedy? He's got so much fucking money, it's, it's incredible. He just made one, one bad move after the other. He was fucking around with his mate. And this is not something we do. You know, we go out as men, we screw around. We're, we're a bunch of dogs. We're in heat all the time. We got the testosterone popping out of our fucking shirts. But me and Frankie are in his house talking with him. And he's talking about Gloria, his mate, was questioned by the FBI on the street. She's got a Colombian accent. He's so good looking, that agent. So Paul's upset about it. Jerk off over here, turns around, and I go like this. I said, Paul, do you want me to take care of this problem? He looks at me and he says, what? And now I get a swift kick him to my leg. Frankie kicked me. What the fuck did Frankie kick me for? What am I doing wrong? Then he says, say that again. And his, the veins in his neck, now I dealt with him. I got his veins out of his neck a few times. But those veins are sticking out of his neck. And he said, what the fuck did you say? Paul. Maybe I think I lost my mind right now. I said, I don't know what I said. I said, if you need me, is there something, is, am I saying something wrong? I get another kick. I says, oh my God, it, it goes away, it's over. We walk out of the house, Frankie gets on one knee, grabs me because we know where the cameras are. We know he can't see it, so that's the way of hugging. He's hugging me, he says, you are so fucking nuts. I said, what the fuck are you talking about? What's the matter? He said he loves this fucking broad. He'll kill me and you for her. The fifth Cadillac in the garage is a big fucking garage. Is glorious. 
and Gloria dictates to his wife. Now, no, Sammy, did you see what reaction he got? You didn't do nothing. You did a normal thing, but didn't you just see the reaction? He was fuming when you did that. He's doing that to his wife. Now, he might have been fuming at me, but I lost a lot of respect for him. Of course, I told Frankie, he's got a gazillion dollars. He can get the most beautiful girl on the planet, buy her a fucking house, buy her a Cadillac, make all the payments, go there every once in a while, do your little bullshit thing and go home. What are you, this, she's fucking two feet. Well, she's bigger than two feet, but two feet fat and ugly. Besides, what the fuck? And you expose your wife and kids and everybody like that in the house? Who knew the story behind it? With the well, they know. Obviously, other people know. I didn't know it. I'll give you an example of goes in Austria. That's crazy. Tato, who's my mentor, who talks to me and teaches me about goes in Austria, a different way than the Columbos. He says, one day I'm in the restaurant and it's a neighborhood restaurant. And he says, I'm sitting with my gumada. A gumada is his girlfriend. You got your wife and your gumada. You know, girlfriend, you're treating her almost like a wife. You see it in movies all the time. He says, and the door opens up and Carlo Gambino and four or five guys walk in. They go to the other side and they sit at a table. Back then, you don't even record, you don't wave, hey, Carl, you don't do nothing like mm -hmm. that. You don't even send a drink, you don't do nothing. You just look at him. You may have tilt your head like you just did, tilt your head a little bit, or look eye to eye. That's how saying hello to each other. You don't, this, this is a secret society and a brotherhood. Forget Gotti, this was back then. It's a secret society. He may look back and give you a little head shake. He's acknowledged you. Now, there's a guy sitting there, there's five of them. One guy gets up and he walks over to Tato. Hey, Tato, how you doing? There's an empty chair right next to him. Call. He says, go, go sit in the chair over there, an empty chair for a minute. What's your girl's name? Rosie, hey Rosie, my name is blah, 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 blah. How you doing? And he gets into a bullshit conversation to keep her occupied. He goes over and he sits with Carl. Carl Gambino tells him, according to Taro, how you doing, Taro? Oh, good, good, Carl, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. That woman over there, that's your Yeah, what's her name? Rosie. She's a beautiful girl. She really is a beautiful girl. He said, you come to this restaurant all the time, right? Yeah. You come here with your wife once in a while too, no? Yeah, let me ask you something. What do you think these people think when they see you now with your gumara? Oh, they don't think nothing. They ain't never gonna say nothing. No, no, of course they're not gonna say nothing. They're afraid of you. They're not gonna say nothing. I don't mean to you or to me. What do you think they say to each other? What do you think they say when your wife comes in? Tato's girlfriend is so much prettier than his wife. Look at the difference in the bodies, how gorgeous that one is. You don't think they're gonna talk like that? They're human beings. They're not gonna say nothing, I agree with you. But I don't look at it that way. Oh, huh. all right. But it's pretty obvious. So let me ask you a question, Taro. Do you love your wife? Of course, of course, Paul, I do love my wife. Let me ask you something, Taro. Do you love me? Of course, Carl, of course I love you. I hope you don't love me like you love your wife. Go ahead, go sit with your good mom. Now, maybe a lot of people here this won't even understand what the fuck this is. This is Goza Nostra to the core. This is true Goza Nostra. How do you think I felt knowing Paul is doing this with the maid? It might be funny to people. His maid in the house in front of his wife and kids and things. Well, I mean, of course he's not hugging her and kissing her, leaving that thing right in the house. So when I look at it, when you get maid and you're a maid guy, we're brothers. Your wife is my sister-in-law. Your kids are my nieces and nephews. I'm in the bar, I see your, your daughter, God forbid. And she's acting a little stupid for a girl. Come over here. Don't give her no more drinks. Go home, get the hell out of here. The guy looks, you, get out of here. Go home, you're, beha you're not behaving nice. I'm your father's friend, go home. We do that, we care about your wife and your kids. He is the father of the family. So he's my father. He made me. She would take my son, Gerard. Oh, little Gerard, come over. When I would go with my kid, put him on the thing, sit down, give him milk and cookies. She literally was like my grandmother. 
She was a lot older than me. But she was my mother, according to Goza Nostra. How the fuck could you do? This is funny when you don't know. But picture now your father, your father, not Paul, doing this to your mother. How would you feel? That's the way I'm supposed to feel. This is my father, this is my mother. Dad, what the fuck are you doing, bro? I like to fuck just like you, but in the house like this, bro? Mommy looks like a fucking rig, and other people know about it, too. She looks like a fool to the world. Is that what, is that what you think of? That's Cosa Nostra. People don't hear that, people don't know it. People think, when you watch all these movies, that we go out and we shoot people and we fucking drink and party and... That's all we do. We're not human. That's all we do. And it seems like we always talk about the worst. You want to talk about the worst of me, the, the 19 murders. You want to talk about the worst. You don't want to talk how I feel with that. How I felt maybe on some of those murders tore me the fuck apart. I went to a funeral that I did, I caused, but I didn't cause it, he caused it. So when I went to the funeral of the box and I did the sign of the cross, of course I said it to myself, look what the fuck you did. You knew I would be shooting you. That's our life. But you broke these fucking rules. You knew you would die. Whether it's me or Tommy or Lenny, you knew this would happen. It was me, I killed you. But look what the fuck you did. Look over my shoulder. Look at your family. You did this. You gave me this fucking scar in my heart, you fuck. I loved you like a brother. You forced this. And if I don't do it, I die. And you die anyway. That's our rules. That's the life. That's Cosa Nostra. So, but people don't ever talk about that or think about that, I don't think. I didn't see this in movies. Maybe if I do a scripted show, it'll be in my scripted show. Maybe if I talk on my podcast or my book. Things will happen and come out. And I don't even do this podcast, book, interviews, or whatever. I'm not even doing this for greed or money. I'm 74 pushing 75. I got fucking 22 years in prisons. All this fucking baggage. I don't give a fuck. Of course I want money. Not for anything anymore. My life is damn near over. I want to take care of my ex-wife, my son, my daughter. I'd like to help them before I go and some people who stayed loyal to me throughout this miserable experience. Those are my motives. Those are clear my motives. You still trust people? Of course, of course. I trust you. I already thought. You think I don't think? I, don't, I think about every fucking thing. You think I would sit in here with you and these other people with the lights dim if I didn't think about you or trust you? I trust you. I think you're a gentleman. I looked at some of your past things. I listened to some of the tapes you run. I make decisions before I move. I'm not Alley Boy, I'm Sammy the Bull. I'm a hit guy still. I think like him. Sometimes my wife will, she don't call me a hit guy, but she says, Sammy, right, every fucking thing you do, you think like a fucking gangster. Personal things that come up. I said, Dad, what do you want me to be? You want me to be gay tomorrow? What do you want me to be? I'm a gangster. And that's the way I think. I was brought up my whole fucking life. So I, th I think of every fucking thing. I analyze everything that's said or done or anybody I do business with. And there's people who do business with me now who are as le legitimate as it comes. The guy uh, from Mosaic. They're, them and their wives and people talk to me and, and deal with me. My whole neighborhood talks to me, loves me. They blow horns, they come over. A woman rang my fucking bell because I was home alone. And she came in with a pot of fucking stew. I said, what's that for? She says, and I said, I know you were home alone. For, for days, I just want you to eat, eat. She's giving me food to eat. And I get along all over the place with everybody, just about. I was gonna say I'm not a drunk, I don't drink. I don't take drugs. I don't gamble. John got mad that I don't gamble. Who, who, who what gangster don't gamble? I'm this gangster. What were the biggest differences between you and Gotti, personality-wise? Every difference you could possibly have. I walked around with a fucking sweatshirt. I abided by Goes in Austria. I didn't want to be noticed and saw and go around with a $3,000 Brioni suit and a hand-painted tie and telling everybody, I'm Sammy the Bull, one of the biggest gangsters in the world. That's what he did. I'm John Gotti, I'm one of the biggest gangsters in the world. I'll never forget, we were in a club one night and one of the, John, John had two bodyguards, Bobby Borriello and another guy. And Bobby Borriello whispers in my ear, he says, Sammy, 
there's two people at the other end of the bar and they're, they're watching you guys real close. Do you want me to go and rouse them up and see what's going on? I said, no, 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 hold up. I said, John, Bobby noticed there's two people at the other end of the bar. On the other end, all the way at the end, don't look now. And uh, they're looking at us. Bobby wants to know, should he go over there and, you know, push it around a little bit, check it out? Sammy, no, no, you can, I, I saw that they were looking. That's our public. That statement hit me like a ton of bricks. Our public. Now, I didn't say this, but my mind said, we're gangsters. We are under the radar. We don't exist. We're a secret society and a brotherhood. What fucking public? We're not actors. We're not married to actresses. We're public. What the fuck are you talking about? We don't exist to the public. He's proud of it. He called them over. Gave him an autograph to think. I'm, I'm rubbing my head. I said, what the fuck? This ain't even real. So what difference is? I never did that. I was with him. I was dressed. We came from somewhere. But I never did that. Even now I don't do it. I don't brag about... See, I spent 22 years in prisons. A good part of it is after I cooperated. You go in prison and after you cooperate, it's, it's a tough place to do time. I got along with everybody. Blacks, white, Hispanic, Asian American. There, even though there's not that many Asians, but different gangs, ABs, a familia, Mexican gangs. And I didn't get killed. I didn't even get into that many battles. John went in. All his racist bullshit, he got hit. He got beat to a pulp by a black guy. Then he tried to pay the ABs to get even. I didn't have to pay nobody. I walked around. I would tell, I had a, an argument with a guy on the phone. He was a moose. So when I first get into that unit, this big unit, and I said, this is an MCC. I said, what phone is ours that we use? Or the phone over there on that wall? It, how come he's on the phone? No, each tier has a phone. He's not on our tier. Is he on our tier? No. But he takes the phone. What do you mean he takes the phone? Don't he have a phone? Yeah, but he takes that one too. Takes whatever phone he wants. Takes whatever phone he wants. Yeah. So how long do we have to wait for to make a phone call? When, when he gets off? No, I'm not waiting until he gets off. And I walk over and I tap him on the shoulder. Bro, you on my phone. I got to make a phone call. You want to hang up? He said, get the fuck out of here. So I'll break your fucking face. All right, but get off the phone anyway. I want to make the call. Then you can break my face. You do whatever you want. Hold on. Uh, hey, listen, I'll call you back. That's some fucking maniac. No, you, you ain't going to use the phone. Oh, I'm going to use the phone. I'm going to tell you what happens now. And I'm squared up. I'm ready to go. I said, I'm going to tell you what happened. Me and you are going to fight. Maybe you're going to break my ass. I, more than likely, the way you look, more than likely you will. Don't ever go to sleep. You better kill me. Don't go to sleep. When you sleep, I'll kill you. I give you that promise, you motherfucker. Who's this fucking maniac? That's Sammy the Bull. I could give you the, f no, no, you can't give me nothing. You can give me a beating if you want right now. You can't even use this fucking phone no more, unless you ask my permission. If no, none of us on my tier is using it, I don't give a fuck, use it. I stood my ground, but I didn't play games like John, racist shit, I didn't do that. And I didn't even say the guy was a black guy, but he was. Because it's not a racial thing with me. I don't give a fuck what he was. I want my phone. But I didn't play that game in prison. I, they knew I stood my ground, small as I am and as old as I started getting. And I didn't fuck with nobody. I didn't play any racial games. I didn't do anything. And people knew that more than likely, if we're going to do something, we get, let's kill him. Because he's not going to just ignore it or walk away or accept the beating. He's not gonna do that, he's gonna come back. And that's what I did all my life, and in prisons. The part earlier when you were talking about you and Gotti are speaking, and he told you, you're gonna take it, I'm gonna get out because I'm the boss, they need me, you do the time, and you walked away. What, what is the process from there to Frank coming up to you saying, he's extremely paranoid in prison, he's you know out of control with the words, what he's saying, Sammy, we gotta go, you know, uh, if we get out of this and we leave, we got to take them out. You're the boss. That's way before. Just let, that's before. Way that's before. before your conversation with them. So the question I have for you is the following. That's at the end. I did 11 months with him. When, I, when that conversation happened, I'm already in prison 11 months with him in MCC. So all them things, out, stories like that, pre. Uh, pre, leading up to this. And I still was there. 
This conversation, I got 22 years in prisons. This is the worst 11 months I did in all my prisons. And I did rotten fucking time in some hell holes because that are locked down. The, the 11 months we was in was the worst. Why is that? It was just, it was torture. He didn't want to go in. He did not want to go in jail and he was fucking weird. I'll give you another story. It's in books, so I can tell you this. When we first get in, a little time has passed. I get a visit. My wife grabs my hand and she's saying, oh, Sammy, you're in so much trouble. And she's rubbing my hand. She, she feels sorry for me, I guess. So she's rubbing my hand. You're in so much trouble. I read the papers. I said, baby, don't, don't, don't. Fuck the papers. Don't worry about the papers. They bullshit a lot. Frankie Lacasio, we're on a visit. Him too, John too. Frankie Lacasio taps me on the shoulder. I said, what is it, bro? And I lean over so he could say something in my ear. I don't know what he's gonna say. He tells me, tell your wife to stop rubbing your hand. What'd you say? Tell your wife to stop rubbing your hand. Frankie, what the fuck are you talking about? I don't even actually realize she's rubbing my hand. Now, now I'm looking at it, she's rubbing, rubbing my hand. And he points, not with his finger, but with his head, he nods to John. So I look up to John, John is as his hands crossed across his chest with a smirk and a nod. I said, what the fuck is this? I turn around to my wife, I said, babe, stop rubbing my hand. Why? Because if the guards see it, they might take it as a contact visit and they stop the visit. Because you're not supposed to have a contact visit. They may take that. She stopped. The visit is over, we go, all three of us, the, the visitors are gone. Like I'm standing in the back with all of us and we're getting undressed, nude. So it's just a strip search. I said, John, what the fuck was that all about with my wife? She said, you're the underboss. You gotta act like an underboss. I gotta act like an underboss. My wife was rubbing my hand. She wasn't giving me a hand job. What the fuck are you talking about? Who the fuck you think you're talking to like that? And hey, maybe you're right. And I, and I basically bend over, look up my ass, and I, we start getting dressed and go back in. But these things made me sick. There's a hundred of them. When you say in the Diane Sawyer interview, I knew if Frank came, he's gonna deny it that he never said he wants to be the one that take the hit. He wants to one, be the one that pulls the trigger. But then you said you had 10, 12, 14 names that you had to take out, the brother, the son, all these guys. You write it on a piece of paper, then you, you know, crumble the paper, you throw it away, and you say no. Then you went to the FBI. How were you processing that decision in that no, moment? No, I went, I went, I went later. In other words, once Frankie tells me that I'm processing, when we kill him, again, I don't stop the process. I don't just sit on my ass. Okay, duh, duh, we're gonna kill him when we get up. Okay, no, there's a process. And I start thinking, where we're gonna kill him, who's gonna drive him, where we're gonna bury him, who, who do I have to kill? His brother, son, this one, that one, Jeannie Gotti. I happen to like Jeannie Gotti. I think he's the, he's the best of the Gottis. At one point, it was 14, 15 people on a piece of paper. I ripped it up and flushed it down the bowl. I said, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not killing, I'm not doing why, nothing. Why though? No. Why? I quit. What do you mean, why? I quit. Here's my best fucking friend, my boss. I did so many things for this guy. All them trials, he, I rigged the trials. I threatened people. I fucking bribed people. And this is all fact. And he turns on me. You love your wife? She's extremely loyal to you in every possible way imaginable. Suppose that she turns on you like a fucking beast tomorrow. Well, how would you feel? This is how I felt. I was betrayed by somebody who's a brother, a, a father, somebody that you gave your whole life to, betrays you. Not some fucking guy who just pointed you out of a mug book or a cop or, no, this is the, the closest person to you. He survived on kind of you. You're surviving that kind of him. And now when the, when the rubber meets the road, he's throwing you to the wolves. It broke my heart. It broke me. Wouldn't that be a bigger reason to make the move, though? If you think about it, what happened with Paul? Paul well, broke the heart. Well, I'll tell you how fucked up I am. I'm a tremendous plotter. The fuck when Fra Frankie tells me we're going to go to a victory party? Like, we were dead. We're not going to go to no victory party. We can't beat the case. Normal Sammy the Bull would immediately have plotted and killed him in prison. And I'll tell you another thing, if he died in prison, their case, I'm not even on the tapes. So get, throw these tapes out. Or you gotta produce who's saying these things. He's saying about Sammy. He's not saying about Sammy the Bull, he's just saying Sammy. How do I know that's me? 
There's a million Sammies out there. Down in the f fucking case, he actually talks good. I'm going to make him the boss. He's got to run the family if I'm gone. I love the guy. He's talking out of both sides of his mouth. But a jury will never know that. That's not me. And there was a guy, Sammy Cash, who died not long before that. I could have turned around and said, he's not talking about me. He's not talking about this Sammy. He loves this Sammy. He's talking about Sammy Cash. I would have had a shot. But I wasn't looking at nothing. I, I mentally broke. The normal Sammy would, wouldn't have mentally broke. He would have thought, just like I thought about coming here to talk. I think about every fucking thing all the time. That whole thing to me was, it's over. I'm That's why I'm done. asking a question, because your methodical way of making decisions, if you would have gone the same way you have, that position you would have gone a di different direction with your trends. That's the only reason I'm asking the question. I'm not asking a question to say it's the better decision or not the better decision. Not if me. a person's always make a decision a certain way, all of a sudden there's a change. Is that heart? Is that revenge? Is that I'm done? Is that I'm not living this That's life? That's shock. Shock. I, everything I ever believed in, I give it up, bro. I'm done. Fuck the mob. Fuck him. I don't give a fuck if I get killed because that's the rules. I don't give a fuck no more. I'm over, it's done. Now, normally I should have just killed the Brighton fucking joint. Fuck the time. Add that on. This, I'm, I'm gonna get life on this one. Add, add another life. I'm in jail with two, two lives. I don't give a fuck no more. I gave up. When you're gonna say these things on the stand, my daughter or my wife could at least say, well, he was a gangster. He stood up and he did life. That's him but I'm gonna be abused by my own lawyers. He's a fucking monster. He's an animal. That's what my wife and daughter and son are gonna have for the rest of their life. Yeah. And he didn't even fight back. He didn't say a fucking sat there like a fucking potted plant and let all these things be said. So it must be true. So I just, I just walked away. You know, it's interesting you say that because you said once that John doesn't want anybody to be as equal, right? And I guess I was shining too much. And when you talk to a lot of people in the world, they'll say, Sammy had more relationship with the people in the streets because John would give the order to you and then as the underboss, you would go execute it. But you were the one that was still in the streets doing business, the construction, all this other stuff. So you had a lot of the context. Do you think in the back of his mind when he's by himself, he's sitting there saying, the way I became a boss is we took out Paul. Doesn't history repeat itself? What if Sammy takes me out to become the boss? Do you think any of that crossed his mind? Of course it did. Of course it did. Here's a couple of things I'll tell you that I know for sure. There's a guy, I think it was in the Genovese family, went to John in the club, meaning well, he said, John, you really know how to pick him. And John tells him, what do you mean? He says, Sammy, it's fucking crazy. He's controlling the whole city of New York. You can't get a fucking job unless you get a wink and a nod from him. Unbelievable. Instead of saying, good, that's my man. That's my man. You want something done? I'll get it done for you. No, it bothered the shit out of him. I had 200 carpenters working for me in, in these partitions. So my guys, I, I go in, we do a good fucking job. I take away all your union bullshit. I'm not breaking your balls. So these people ain't stupid. Give that job to Sammy. Now, I could only take so much. Then, okay, then give it to Patrick. Patrick, you're gonna get this job. Good, give me a little something over here. Okay, John had fucking money coming in up the fucking wazoo. And he's complaining about the guy disrespecting him. The fuck are you talking about, bro? Oh yeah, yeah, all right, Sammy, I understand the whole thing. I understand it now, leave it alone, okay? That's construction. So, job didn't have a clue. So we go back to the guy, you know how to pick him. He got mad, went back to that story. And another guy comes in from the Colombo family. Captain, hey John, I went to Tally's, Sammy's club on 18th Avenue, Tally's. Yeah. He said, I went there on a Tuesday night. Sammy lends out money, he's a big shower. I had a million and a half in the street. So Tuesday, everybody comes and divvies up, they make their payment, they want to borrow, 20 or 30, I'm hook. Get that envelope for Patrick, boom, that's 20 or 30 you're getting. I do my business on that night. My people are around, tallies is packed. So the guy goes in, he says, 
Wow, I went there on fucking Tuesday. Bro, this fucking captain, he was an underboss from other families, union bosses. This fucking shame, he became so fucking powerful, it's crazy. That was intimidating to him. Rather than saying, that's my man, I'll put it in your lap. You're my man, somebody comes to me. I mean, Patrick set up 15 interviews and I'm making a ton of money with you. That's my man. You want an interview? Go to him. You want a podcast? Go to Mosaic. I'm saying you to my people. Why would I get intimidated by you? But I guess the power, but I, I think it was more ego. John had an ego like the Empire State Building, like me. If you ever see me walking with him, I'm holding the umbrella while it's raining. I'm one step behind. I always want to put him out there. That's your job, bro, not mine. My job is being low key. And a lot of times you won't see me in a suit. And you had no desire ever to be a boss? No. You had zero aspirations. I'm very happy being the underboss. Believe me, make me the underboss of your company. Watch how happy I am. But I don't want, I don't want to be a schmuck and I don't want to be, you know, I want to be rewarded for what I do. Zero motivation to be a boss. Zero. I never really gave it a tremendous thought. Got it. Underboss to me at that time of the most powerful organized crime family in the country was way more than I ever thought. In other words, I never thought I'd reach that height. And I, Gotti had five brothers in the mob. I didn't have no brothers, uncles, aunts, cousins, nobody in the mob. Because you know, a lot of times, great empires that fall, it's typically uh, internal flattery, who gets credit, who's getting attention, who's outshining who. How much were you having other peers coming up to you saying, hey, Sammy, look, man, amongst us, we know who runs the family. Hey, amongst us, we know who's... Was there anybody playing that game in your ear or no? There was none of that flattery taking place. No. The only guy who ever did that to me was Dicky Scarfo. He was the boss of the Philadelphia family. One day, I got home late around 9, 10 o'clock. His nephew, Philly and Eddie, calls me up. Sammy, what are you doing? Nothing. I just got home. Well, what's up? He says, my uncle wants to see you. Could you come down? Now, let's go down to Atlantic City. It's a two-hour, 10, 15-minute drive for me. And then I got to come back. It's like four and a half hours. You, this can't, you know, Sammy, he wants to see you. All right, I'm on my way. My wife says, where are you going? You just got in. I got to go somewhere. I get in the car and I go. They take, he wasn't allowed in the casinos, but he was in the hotel pod. He was up on whatever floor. I come in, they take me through the casino. I go to the elevator. I go up there. I go in the room. He's in there. Hey, Nick, how you doing? Now, I, I did a lot of things with Nicky. How you feeling, bro? He says, good, Sammy, good. And I gave him a lot of information. I did things for him. I helped him win the war, his war. So we're close. And he always comes into the family through me, whether it's in my house, somebody else's house, my brother-in-law's house, somebody. It always comes in through me. So he says, you having any trouble with this fucking bum? Who are you talking about? What bum? Who are you talking about? John. I said, bro, he's my boss. He's my fucking friend. Why do you want to talk to me like that? Why would you say that with me? Why would you do that? Sammy, Sammy, I calm down. I understand. I understand what, what you know. He wanted me to come in through somebody else, through Joe Butch. I didn't like it. I didn't like the smell of it. Why would he want to do it? From day one, I came through you. Why would he want to change that? I don't have a fucking clue. I don't have a clue. Maybe, maybe he figures I'm tired. I have no idea. But please don't, don't, don't put me on the street that we're gonna talk. I, w I wouldn't do that to you. Don't, don't do that with me. All right, Sammy, all right, don't take it personally. But let me tell you one thing, bro. Come on, we're close, let me talk to you. What? If you have a problem, let me know. I'm on your side, bro. He's saying it to you. He's saying it to me. If you have a problem, keep your eyes open, bro. If you have a problem, come to me, I'm on your side. Mm -hmm. Nikki. I am exhausted, bro. I, I thank you so fucking much. I gave him a kiss. I think I went for his ear. I think I hit him half on the fucking lip. Boom, I gave him a fucking kiss. I walked out and says, I thank you so much, Nikki. I really, really do. It's nice. I'm just a little cranky. It's late. I'm exhausted. You want me to have somebody drive you home? No, I got my car. I'll, I'll get home. Don't worry about it. And I went home. But it made me think, why is a boss of another family out of state saying this. Now, Nikki's no fool. And Nikki wouldn't say that to me if he doesn't feel something's right. This was towards the end. And I've gotten other clues with things. 
But I still wouldn't go against my better judgment than to be loyal to John, like a dog, no matter what happened. I'm, you ever get a dog and you can beat him up sometimes? You give him a kick at his fucking ass? Three seconds later, he's wagging his tail at you? That's me. I'm loyal to anybody. Unless you fuck with me or betray me or do something crazy, then I'm do, I'm, I could become your worst nightmare. I admit it. I could become your worst nightmare. I want to eat you alive. He hears these things and, and he's catching delusions. And he's now trying to move guys who were coming through me, have very happily coming through me, pushing them in another direction. Why? You mentioned a lot of businesses that you did, and when you read about it, you, you got a lot of things that comes up. I mean, it was some construction, plumbing, the list is a long list, right? Drywall, flooring, you name it. How many of them were legit? How many of them were not? Was it a split between no, the they two? No, they were legit. Okay. They're legit to the point that they're legitimate business. But I have control to push it in another direction. But I have the power to do that through unions, through jobs, through sure. this, through that. So I have that power and I'm, I'm bringing it to people who, who are around me. People talk about how you run businesses, whether it's the children of the deceased, fathers or whatever it may be. Based on what they say, you can agree or disagree with this. There's a system. So a lot of times there's investment companies where they go in and their specialty is buying businesses and they're not doing good and they build them up and then they keep and they take revenues. Was your system the following system? I'm curious to know what you're going to say to this. System number one, step number one, find a local profitable business. Number two, give them protection. Number three, eliminate the owner. Number four, take over the business. Number five, show up to the funeral. Would you say that was partially I never partially did any of those things. No, okay. no, that's ridiculous. I'm curious to hear about it because never, that's been I never said killed, by others. I never killed a partner okay. or, a, or a business associate. I never went into a profitable company and said, give me a piece and I'm going to give you a potato. I never did any of that. That's in the movies. That's not me. The government, after I cooperated, said, how come nobody ever fucking ratted on you? So it's the same question you're asking me in a different way. I told them, why would they? Who, don't listen to Gotti on that tapes. Who did I hurt? What did I do? Everybody I did business with was extremely successful with it. Very few of them I had even contracts. I had verbal commitments. I give you my word, you give me your word, you keep your books. Why? Why would I do it that way? God forbid you drop dead, your kids take it, I got nothing to do with it. I'm not, I'm not gonna control your kids. Your kids own it. So we have no paper, don't even worry about shit like that. Unless your kids have problems and wanna come to me, then I'll talk to them. But I never bullied my way into anything. When I had the drywall company, I had over 200 carpenters working for me. A contractor would call me up. Sammy, I am so stuck. I need 30 guys. Well, no matter who he calls, he can't get 30 guys overnight. I would go in with Joey Madonia. He needs 30 guys. We could shut down this and we could pull some from here and we could, good. Send them 30 carpenters tomorrow. How am I fucking hurting anybody? The guy got 30 carpenters. I'll give you another little example. I was partners with a Jewish contract, a verbal. It's gonna give me 10% of the project. It's high, a small high rise, not a big, big one. The job is what they call construction a bastard. Everything under the sun goes wrong with it. No matter what happens, they order nuts and bolts, the fucking nut don't fit in the hole. Everything is a disaster. Every little fucking thing that could go wrong went wrong. So he calls me up, Samuel, I'm gonna, we're gonna take a beating here, really. I mean, I know the job's a bastard, but how, how deep are, are we in the hole? My bun already is with me. May guy, best advisor in the world for a snake snake of a human being, but well, what, what's the story? I'm gonna go in millions in the hole. Your rent is maybe 250,000. Now, back then, 250,000 is 250,000 is a lot of money. Okay, let me, we'll talk, we'll say, let's finish up the job and see where it goes and how it goes. My brother-in-law, as soon as I hang up, you don't have to pay that, why not? He's a Jew, what is he gonna do? He is Jewish and he can't really do nothing. There's no paper, there's no nothing, you're right about that. But who the fuck is going to ever do business with me again after I do this to this guy? Who's going to do business with me? They'll do business, Sammy. You control the union. You'll know, be all right. I paid the 250000 I put up my hand. Two or three months, I'm not exactly positive. Another fucking guy calls me up, another Jewish guy. He says, Sammy, I'm doing a project. I heard uh, you just got hurt over there. Yeah. Yeah, we took a beating. The fucking job, nothing went right, no matter what. 
what we did, it just went, it went bad. He says, yeah, I heard a number, what, what'd you lose? Well, if you heard the number, tell me, what'd you, what'd you hear I lost? 250, 300,000. Well, 250 is the right number, I lost 250,000. He says, that is so fucking honorable for a street guy. I never met a street guy like you. I'm gonna give you a piece of my job. I want you to protect me with unions and this and that and the other thing. And I, you can go, come in with the drywall and this, that and the other thing. Here's a guy in these stories that I go raping fucking people left and right, and I don't do that. That's why nobody ever ratted on me, except for John with his fucking big mouth. Nobody ratted on me. And I'm dealing with 15 different companies. I got unions up the wazoo. I don't back up like when I told you how I shared the fucking money. Everybody earned. The union delegate, the, the, the president, the vice president, the union delegate, the shop steward. How many people did you have control of at your peak outside of union? I mean, jur judges, cop, I mean, was it, who else was it? No, I didn't have no judges or cops. I mean, I, I, there was cops, a couple of cops working that were, but I didn't have cops and judges. I didn't bribe people like that. I didn't want to get involved with people like that. What's the story of the $60,000 to a jury? Was that a complete? That's true. That's true, the 60 k to a jury. Yeah. Okay. John was on trial. That's another thing I did for John. Every trial he had, I either threatened jurors or paid jurors or bribed jurors. I did everything under the sun. The 60000 was the head of the Westies, a guy named Bosco, comes to me and says, Sammy, the head guy on the, on the jury panel for John's trial, mm -hmm. he's facing life. I could get to him, really. All right, let's get to him. Let me, I want to talk to him. Let's get to him. I work out an agreement that I will give him $60,000. $20,000 up front, $20,000 in the middle of the trial, and $20,000 at the end. And after the trial, I'll get him a job as a team's foreman, and he'll be making sixty-five dollars to $75,000 a fucking year because he was unemployed. I'll do all those things, and he'll become our friend. That's great, I'll tell him. I'll tell him a little bit more. If he reneges in any way, shape, or form, and he can go to the feds with this, I'll kill him. Once he takes that 20, he's gotta be committed. Oh, he'll be committed, Sammy. I'll tell him myself, I know him. And Bosco's no joke. He went to, out of the country, was fighting in fucking Bosnia in wars. I mean, this guy was a fucking maniac, but we did that. So that's what we did in that particular trial. There's other trials, he had a trial where there was a guy in the carpenters union and he busted up a joint. The guy who owned the place was a May guy. John sent a few of the Westies down to give him a beating. Instead of giving him a beating, the Irish kid, he shot him in his ass. The guy didn't die, but he shot him. Now the guy was scared to death. They were with the Genovese people. We went to talk to them. They didn't want nothing to do with it. Do what you want with the guy. We don't give a fuck. Now the guy was gonna maybe be a witness in the case of what happened. So I went to meet the guy. The guy came, I, how you doing, how you doing? Who are you? My name is Sammy. Maybe you heard of me, Sammy the Bull. Are you Sammy the Bull? Yep. I'm gonna tell you something now. You're gonna go in and you're gonna say this had nothing to do with John and I give him a whole legal argument of what to do. You have two choices. You can go to the FBI and wrap me out. I'll do a couple of years, I'm not worried about it. The next guy who comes will kill you. There's no saving you no more. Or you can run. Just run the fuck out of the state. But you don't have to. I'll always be your friend if you do this in the trial. That's case number two. Two. John wants to sell me out after doing 11 months. Those are two cases. There's more. How do you process fear? So I've heard a lot of different things you say about fear. I've heard you talking to Diane Sawyer about what does fear really mean? You know, you're, you're explaining from a different standpoint, but did fear drive you? Did you have any fear? How did you view fear? Fear to me is that when I was young, I mean, I was doing a robbery and I got shot and, and, and all kinds of things. And all my life, I was in conflict of different things. By the time I got out of the military, even when I went in the military, there's a fear of going to Vietnam. They were bringing on body bags left and right. So I was surrounded with violence and this and that in every way you can look at it. When I finally hook up with the mafia, and I'm 23, when I went home, I said to myself, you won't live to 40. There's no fucking way you're gonna live to 40. You got maybe a 17 year run. So you'll either be dead before 40 or you will be doing 
life in prison. Cause you got, you got no fuck with, you would do all this weird shit. You had accepted that. I accepted that and that eliminated fear. When I'm 40 or 45 and I'm doing things, I have no fucking fear. I'm in three mafia wars. The first one in the Colombo family, it was the second part of the Gallo War. Shorty tells me, and I'm a pup, no, I'm nothing. Shorty says, go home and pack your bags. Pack my bags? Yeah, we're gonna hit the mattresses. Back then, you didn't see movies like this. What are you talking about, hit the mattresses? He started laughing, he says, we're gonna eat, sleep, and shit together 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're gonna try and kill the gallows and they're gonna try and kill us. You're part of us now. Okay, I got a couple of loans, a couple of, I must have had two, three thousand, five thousand out in the street, nothing. I said, I just gotta get the loans and I'll make some pickups in between. No, don't ever talk to me about money again. I got loans out there, what do you mean don't talk to me about money? Just what I said. This ain't about money. Fuck the money, you're even. They don't have to pay me? No, we'll give you money, we'll feed you. Don't worry about money. Worry about killing. Here's what happens, Sammy. We're gonna give you a little fact of life. They're gonna try and kill us. There's a lot of us. There's a pack of us. We're a pack of wolves. So one day, you wanna go pick up your loan. You sneak away from the pack, they see it. Sammy, every week, tries to go pick up monies. You're gonna get killed, for sure. You wanna get laid for your dick. You're gonna sneak away, they'll put that together. You're gonna get killed. You're horny, go jerk off and fuck money. Forget about family, forget about everything. Hit the mattresses. I'm a young kid. I've been in gangs and I'm tough and I'm this and I'm that. This is a whole new fucking world. There's no way I'm gonna survive all this. This is fucking crazy altogether. I'm in a fucking mafia war. I'm fucking 23 years old. This is nuts, I'll never survive this. So it eliminated fear. When we were gonna take out Paul, Frankie the Chico when he was alive and John and we were, you know, Everybody knows the story. John with the tapes and Paul got killed and John Gotti became the boss. But that's not the story. What happened before? Who was involved? How many? What was the problems? Why are we gonna kill Paul? Nobody asked that question. Nobody asked the question of, you're sitting in the car. At 5.30 at night in Manhattan, right before Christmas, there's tens of thousands of people coming out of these buildings all at once. They're not going home now, hustling home. They're waiting for their families who meet them. They go eat, they go see the lights, they go shopping. The, the crowds are astronomical. Nobody asks, what were you doing? What were you thinking in that car with John? John was my driver, by the way. I had the walkie talkie, I had everything. So when we're talking about that, let me get back to that. We're talking about the hit. John says, we could do this and we could do that. And I says, an idea. And he says, no, let me. So Frankie Chico says, oh, Frankie Chico knows I was involved in two wars already with the Columbos. And then with Nicky Scafo in Philadelphia. So he says, no, no, listen, Sammy's done this. Let him plot this out. And I plotted that hit. I'm the guy in the car with a walkie-talkie, with a gun. I made myself a backup shooter. So there's 11 people on there who are gonna kill Castellano. So there's crash car, backup shooters, the four guys who are gonna shoot. Everybody's in place. What's my position? A backup shooter, I'm in the car and I'm calling the shots. While I'm sitting in the car, it's packed and I'm, my eyes are all over the place. There's two fucking cops on the corner and that's only a couple hundred feet away from me. I says, oh my God, this comes down. These cops are gonna pull out their guns and make a move. My job now, the guy who's not pulling the trigger, is to go there and kill them so that the shooters can get away. So when you say, well, you're the shooter, my job now is to kill them. And I'm sick, I don't wanna kill these two cops, but I know what my job is. Thank God, just before they came, they turned around and started walking up the avenue, chatting the other way. So they weren't there. There's actually a cop, from what I know and the government knew, who saw it. And the FBI asked them, why the fuck didn't you pull out your gun? He said, this was so fucking professionally done. I'm not a fucking fool. There must have been backup shooters. Or this guy was 100 feet of maybe 75 feet ahead of me. If he would have pulled out a gun, he was right. I told the FBI, he was right. I would have killed him. I would have told John, pull up, I would have jumped out the fucking door and killed him. So he was right, the, this poor bastard, whoever he was. That again, going back to who's the shooter. Let Alley Boy go shoot him and you think from the background. 
But you're not afraid. Fuck no. I'm Teddy Atlas said you went up to him to want to train with him boxing. And he talked to you about a fear and you said, I'm not afraid. He says, every boxer is afraid. Teddy Atlas is an asshole. Teddy Atlas was with somebody, his brother, cousin, or some fucking yeah. body he was with. So you got to say these things, I think. But he did ask me that question. I would box, I would train with, not him, with another guy, mm -hmm. and, but he knew. And he was like a stumble bum. I used to take care of him. And I wanted him to train my son. My son wanted to fight, so I said, Teddy, train him a little bit. He can fight like a bastard, he just don't want to fight. He's more like my wife than me. Sure. You know? Yeah, he don't want to fight. You, you, you'd have to go there and hit him for him to fight. He'll fight back. And you wish you didn't hit him. He's a tough little bastard, but he won't fight. He's calm natured. If you argue too much and you get stupid, he'll walk away from you. He's not afraid of you, he just won't, he won't fight. You know, he don't want to bother with you. So he's the opposite of me. So Teddy Atlas said to me one day, are you afraid? I said, no. I didn't say I don't have fear. I said, no. In other words, the reason I said no is when I go in the ring, and I did fighting a little bit, not professionally, but in the ring, in the clubhouse, in the whatever. So I see a guy on the other end of the ring. This motherfucker's got, he's got ripples. He's so ripped. So I've got, it's not fear. If the bell rings, I'm going to fight him. But I already know. I might get it beaten. Now, if I was afraid, what do I do? What am I doing in the ring if I'm afraid? But he took it to a different level, meaning that's cowardice. He's coward. He's saying he's not afraid. He's really afraid. He's talking. So it was, it was a whole created thing, which there was a whole entourage of people who wanted to make me look bad and say things like he's an animal, he did this and that. He's afraid. So if he's listening to this fucking thing, he's a tremendous trainer. I don't know how old he is. I'm 74, pushing 75. Teddy, come down and put the fucking gloves on with me. I'll show you how scared I am of you. And you're a fucking bitch. Come down and put the gloves on with me. Or meet me in a bar. Or meet me in a back alley. You fucking punk. Then he said, and I was putting on weight, that I went to a hypnotist. He tells me about a hypnotist all these fighters are going to. What are they going after for? For diets, for this, for that. So I hooked up with the hypnotist. He was on the program yeah. too. And I, he says, what do you want? Nothing, I want to keep up my stamina, number one, so I don't lose, you know, stamina. And I want to adopt, you know, that keep me away from doing certain things, eating certain foods. I'm a fucking sugar freak. I love ice cream, I love, so that's what I'm telling the fucking guy who's a, who's a uh, hypnotist. hypnotist. <laughs> and they make a big deal out of it, like what I was doing. But you punk ass bitch, you haven't done a fraction of anything I've done, good, bad, or indifferent. You're a punk ass fucking trainer. You look like a fighter, but you ain't a fucking fighter. Who'd you fight? And now I'm gonna have a war with him now. The reason why I'm asking this question, Sammy, is because, so in, in, your, in your 20s, you know, the, our brain is still not fully put together. So in our 20s, we're a little bit more aggressive. We take a lot more risk. We're not afraid of anything. Right. Then we go into our 30s and we got a kid, you know, Gerard, you know, Carol, like, oh my God, I, you know, I don't want to make anything. In the 40s, then you go to do time, then you're six and a half years in the hole. You got all this imagination taking over your brain. There is no, am I going to live? Am I going to die? Then you get out and you're set. So are there fears, concerns, things that keep you up at night right now? Like your imagination sometimes probably takes off going back. Does it ever or do you have a hold of it today? I got a hold of it today. You know what I'm worried about today? Well, you could say a bullet in the head, maybe. I, you know, I, I, I think it's the best way to go, tell you the truth. If you shoot good and you shoot in the head, you're instantly gone. You don't feel no pain, you don't feel nothing. So that's number one. I fear cancer, stroke. I can't fear these things more than anything else. You do fear cancer and stroke? Well, I would, I would rather not have that. Yeah, I, I fear that. Saying, yeah. But at this age, I understand if it ain't here now, yeah. in this cute little body, it's going to come. It's sooner or later, it's going to come. We all, there's an end. I see rich people who take care of themselves, highly take care of themselves with mm -hmm. doctors, and they'll die 68, 70, 76, 80. I mean, that's life, that's gonna happen. So am I gonna be afraid of it? I'm not afraid of it, I don't want it because I'd rather die quick than die of cancer because I've seen people die. My friend Joe Peruta died and killed me to watch him die like that. I wouldn't want to die like that. I've seen family members 
get sick. And friends, when I was in jail the second time around, I'm in MCC in the hole. I'm in bed, and the four or five guards come to my cell. I say, Sammy, get up. I look, and they all look solemn. Oh my God, something happened. What happened? We want to tell you some news. Tell me the fuck, what happened? God forbid, my son, my daughter, my ex-wife, whoever. John Gotti died. This was in 2002. <sighs> okay. One God. Look, he don't give a fuck. You're fucking wrong. You don't even know what the fuck you're talking. Why would you tell me I, I, I don't give a fuck? Get, take it the fuck out of here. Why would you say that? Well, Sammy, he was your enemy. Wasn't my enemy. We were like fucking, we were like brothers. We were attached at the fucking hip. I don't want to see nobody die like a fucking dog in prison with cancer. I'm not happy about it. You should be happy. Why, why should I be happy to watch somebody die like that? I would rather shoot him. And I know that's going to sound demented, but it, that's my life. Not watching him die like a dog. He died like a dog. Some guy in one of the prisons, a black guy, came to me with a picture. He said, Sammy, who's this guy? I got the picture. I looked at it, looked at it. I said, I don't know. Come on, Sammy, take another look. I don't know. Who is it? He says, it's Sean Gotti. I did not hit me. I never seen anything like it in my life. Before he died, they must have took, taken a picture of him. He didn't look nothing like John Gotti. It was horrible. And it made me think, what a fucking rotten way he died. It's a shame. But it also makes me think of the whole fucking goddamn judicial system and how many guys are gonna die like that. Die in prison with life. Every place I went, there's who's got life, who's got 50 years, Who's got 30 years? How many guys are going to die like that? And nobody gives a fuck. All they care about is open the borders and let them in. How about the people who are in prisons in this thing? We can go into prison. I like. I would love to go into prison reform and and everything like that. I've been with so many different black guys who were friends in prison. And the prisons, the, the whole system, the judicial system is so rigged. I would talk to them and maybe some guys would ask me a question. It was so fucking rigged. And here's how it's rigged. This poor guy, he's broke, he's coming out of a ghetto. So he don't have a fucking lawyer, they give him a lawyer. Or he gets a cheap ass bullshit lawyer who's really not even a lawyer, he's a jerk off. A horrible lawyer, I'll put it that way. And he gets an investigator, they hire. A drunken ex-cop who's his investigator. This broken down lawyer, this broken down cop is gonna fight his battle against, there's four, five, six excellent attorneys working on your case to bury you against that one guy who don't even know what planet is on. And who's their investigator? The FBI. How can he win? And when you look at the system, they're even lying and rigging fucking things. And I don't want to say the younger agents, I knew they weren't illegitimate, but look at some of them now. How they get things that they could go after Trump. They could do so many fucking weird things. So how does this guy stand a fucking chance? This poor bastard, and I got an eighth grade education, is asking me for help in my cell. I said, bro, ask the lawyer. I mean, I don't know the details of the case, and I'm not a lawyer. Ask your lawyer, wait until the end, before trial, and ask him if he could get a plea. That's the best time you can get a plea. Because when they get close to trial, they don't want to even go. Sometimes they'll give you a good deal. Ask them if they can do that. And I feel so guilty even telling them that, because I really can't tell them you're fucking dead. You're dead. And if you go ahead with your case, instead of taking 10, 15 years on a plate, you're going to get lose the case and get 35 years. So I don't even know what to tell them. And then people would ask me questions because they knew I cooperated with the government, and they would come over and ask me questions. The best answer I used to hear is that it's not perfect, but it's better than Ethiopia's law system. Now I'm in prison. What do I give a fuck about Ethiopia's? legal system. I'm not in Ethiopia. And I don't even know where the fuck that is. But who cares about that? I'm in the United States. I got on my last case 20 fucking years but the government. Listen what the, the sentence by the guidelines is supposed to be. 12 on the low, 15 on the high. I got 20 because Sammy got a lenient sentence the first time. But I got a lenient sentence and I did it. What's that got to do with this sentence? But that's what gave them an upward departure. They gave me 20. Supposed to be doing 17 and a few. I did 17, seven. More than I'm supposed to do. And I got lifetime supervised release. 
and a hundred thousand dollar fine. And I lent them money, even the kids who got pinched, and one a couple of them flipped. Says, did Sammy ever buy the drugs? No. This is their informant. No. Did he sell the drugs? No. Did he go out with Jews, hanging out? No. They were kids. I was 55 years old. I, I wasn't going to go to clubs and hang out with them. So what the fuck did I do? I lent them money. When I took the plea, I told Lynn Stewart, who was my lawyer, I'm copping out to things, Lynn, on this plea. And there's reasons. There's another whole story. It'll be in the book. But I didn't even do. She said, what's the difference? I said, you want to know something? You're right. What the fuck is the difference? Whether they're talking about 50,000 pills, 100,000 pills, or a million pills. I guess it don't make any difference. I mean, let me ask you this question. Mm. So you're running a government. You're running a nation, hypothetically. Okay? And you're thinking from that standpoint. You're sitting there saying to the one conversation, you say, I'm talking to this guy. Hey, get off the phone. No, right now, you don't ever get off the phone. We don't ask my permission. Here's how this is going to go. We're going to fight. You're bigger than me. You're probably going to beat me. But don't close your eyes tonight because I'm going to kill you. And I'm not worried about going to prison for two years. I'll do my time. I'll come out. It's not a big deal. You immediately go to the worst case scenario, right? And the worst case scenario is if you commit a crime and the government's going to have some kind of a punishment for you and the punishment is going to prison, the prison doesn't scare you. So you got life penalty, which is death penalty. Hey, if you do this, we'll kill you. Let's take that part aside. You got imprisonment. What punishment could there be for you to not even think about committing that crime because you don't want to face the punishment? Is there any punishment that would have prevented Sammy the Bull from committing the pro crime? No. So, so it's not the punishment that you're seeing. And I wouldn't have got, if I would have killed the guy on the phone, I wouldn't have got two years or I got life. Life. And right. I understood that. But what I'm asking you is, is there any kind of punishment to change to say for the rest of your life you can't do X, Y, Z, or we're going to do this. Where does it hurt to hurt the criminal where the criminal says, that, that pain, I'm not willing to put up with. Well, why wouldn't I take the... Uh, that's, a good, that's a good point. It's a good point. I'll give you that. It's a good point. But take my point. How about these fucking people who just broke fucking laws against Trump and broke every law in the fucking book? They're not using the RICO law against them. They used it against us, the Italians, the black, the Hispanic. Why don't they use it over here? If Comey, he's the head of the FBI, somebody in the Justice Department, and somebody in this CIA and somebody in this organization, they're all hooking up and they all broke the law. Let's assume that's happening and that's true. Why don't they use the RICO law on them? That they can't win. They made the RICO. So the fucking RICO law is made for me and blacks and Hispanic and people that you could put in prison. You want the people to look at us while you break the law. We're the crook. Worry about Sammy. Yeah, I robbed 100,000. Why you guys are robbing millions? Listen, I understand the government better than anybody. You know why? Because they're all different families to me. The Democratic Party is the Gambino family. The Republican Party is the Genovese family. The fucking moderates is the Colombo family. The fucking media is this family. Hollywood is this family. They're all different families. Everybody's got a motive. Everything. Look at the whole fucking picture. It's all green. It's all about money, the whole country. So if you look at it through my eyes, everybody's doing what I did. Everybody, not everybody. There's legitimate people who are caught in the mix of this. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about these congressmen and governors and people. They caught all the time, left and right. What do they get, a kick in the ass, a boot on the slap on the wrist? Why is all these other people, that law, it's gotta be so good and so bad. I told you in the beginning, you want to stop a lot of crimes? Give opportunities. We robbed as a mob, you guys are robbing. You're robbing too much. We took a sliver of the pie so other people could eat. Human beings could eat. You're taking everything. A, a fucking middle class person can't eat. They can't go to a movie sometime. They can't spend nothing because they're broke. They're broke because of reasons. Your reasons. If you want to hit me with 3,000 years, Okay, but let me sit next to whoever. James Comey. Hey, bro, how many years did you get? 40. Oh, that's cool. I got 25, or well, I got 50, or well, I got life. Where is his seat? Where is he in prison? In what cell? 
I could tell you all the black and Hispanic and every fucking body else like me, they're in prison. Now, I'm not saying if you break the law, there's no consequence. Make an equal, fair system. The whole country, to me, I look at the country, I don't know, even know what planet I'm on. I got out of prison, I seen phones, I don't know even how to use a fucking, till now. I have a hard time with the phone. I look at computers, I don't know what planet I'm on. You almost eliminated my existence. When I got out, you gotta talk to the television. Go to Netflix. If you don't do that, nothing happens. Before when I used to talk to a television, they thought I was crazy. Now if you don't talk to the television, you're crazy. So look at the system. Don't look at me as an individual. I got away with X. So did everybody. So did this whole country built on it. Look at universities. They got people hating conservatives. Now I was a liberal most of my fucking life. Sometimes I'm, I'm a moderate. Sometimes I think the conservatives are right. I'm on that side. Sometimes I think the liberals are right. I'm on that side. I'll give you another example. I'm in the fucking gym. I go to the gym and there's a whirlpool. I'm sitting in there for my fucking raggedy ass bones and I'm getting a, a whirlpool and there's a woman in there and a guy, he's sitting up on top with his feet in the fucking thing and she's in there up to her neck. And they're talking about letting illegal aliens in. We should give them uh, licenses and we should give them cars and we should give them social security and we should give them food stands. We should give them this and this. And I'm listening to the whole thing. 10, 12, 15 minutes goes by. I'm toasted. I'm ready to get out. I got to open my mouth. That's just me. I said, do you people mind if I injected myself into your conversation for two or three minutes because I'm going to get out? No, no, no. God. I said, you're a really, really good people, both of these. Really, really good people. You're so interested in helping people. I like that. These are really good people. The only thing is that these are racist, the Baltics. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not racist. Yes, you are. What do you mean? We didn't say anything about black people. I don't give a fuck what you said. What you said is you want to give all of this. You didn't say one word about helping black people in our country. Their forefathers came here from like fucking slaves. They're stuck in some ghettos. They need opportunities. You didn't see one word about helping them, just Hispanic people running across the border. So you're good people, but you forgot a whole section of our country and they belong here. Maybe not by their own will, but they belong here. So I think he's a racist. And I'm gonna go because I've been in this thing for 15 minutes. So I added my two minutes. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you later. I get up and walk the fuck out. But that's the truth. Look at what the fuck is going on in the country. You can't ask me, how would you think? Or this is too much, or this is this when all this is going on. If you want to point out all of my wrongs, and I agree with you, I would say, like I told you from the beginning, I wish I had a different opportunity when I was born and raised. I wish I wasn't dyslexic. Only God knows what I would have done, that my parents would have been proud of me, would have helped me to go to schools. I'm not a bad person. I don't enjoy, this is going to sound hypocritical too, I don't like killing or enjoy it. I don't like it. I just do it like a soldier would do it for the military, like I was going to do in Vietnam if I would have went there. I, I don't know. No, the only Vietnamese people I know do my fingernails or my toenails and they're great people. I don't, and when I look at it sometimes, I, they're so nice. I say, what the fuck were we doing in Vietnam? Nothing happened. And they, they, not, they didn't come over here and rape our, the whole country from the beginning, it was a great country. It's, there's no country like it. I agree with them. The legal system, there's nothing like it. But you gotta make it fair all the way around. Then maybe you don't make people like me. Maybe you don't have that many people shooting each other in Chicago. Maybe a lot of things are different. It's on you, motherfucker, not me. The reason why I'm asking that question. I know, you. I, listen, you're an intelligent guy. No, I'm I was, actually asking I a question. I wasn't sure what I was gonna do with this interview. I got yeah. to really like you now. I'm not going to give you no more interviews, but... <laughs> it's the last one. You, honestly, though, I'm asking a question because for me, it goes back to how do we prevent the eight-year-old Sammy from getting into that? That's the part. And then, from, and then from there, how do we make the 22-year-old Sammy who is about to commit something to say, I don't know if I'm willing to face that crime. He never becomes the 22-year-old If Sammy. we handle that eight years old. Yes, we not just the Sammy. So, so it goes back. Every fucking kid right. in this country, 
They, God made them, that's our future. We're all gonna get old and die, no matter what we do. That's our future, all those little kids. That's why child molestation and these degenerates, you gotta kill them. I believe in capital punishment for them, rapists, who grab a woman, she's just walking to work, she might have a nice body, whatever the fuck turns you on about her. You wanna to talk to her and try to make her good, but leave her the fuck alone, leave your hands off her. Make the field when they're young, go. Put back people who understand psych, learning disabilities. I mean, they're on it now. From I see from the kids, my grandchildren, they go to school. I see they're all more into it. Get them even more into it. Start there, invest the money in the kids and you won't have 22 year olds. Now you're always gonna have a nut. That's why gun control don't work. You're always gonna have screwballs and they're always gonna do something weird. If they don't use a gun, they'll use a knife or they'll use a bomb. Or they'll, they'll find a way to get it. Or they'll hit you with a car. Or they'll hit 15 people with a car. Just complete assholes. Sammy, when you went to a, a, a prison, you know, a lot of people go to prison. They find Machiavelli, some find Jesus. Who did you find in prison? You know, I, I looked for Jesus. I looked for prayer. And Jesus wasn't in any of the prisons I was in. And I already knew Machiavelli, so I didn't find him in prison. What I did find is this. In 2004, they took away smoking. And I wanted to smoke. Especially when you tell me I can't. That that's, makes me want to smoke. I go by the Indians. They have this little group of Indians. And they're in a circle. And they put tobacco. It's Indian tobacco. It ain't regular tobacco. It's shitty tobacco. In a pipe. And they smoke it past the pipe around. So I wanted to smoke. So I went and asked them if I could join their uh, group. And they said, you got to check with the counselor and the chaplain. And I went there. And I said, I want to change my religion to Indian. I'm an Indian. Native American Indian now. You could do that in the federal government. You want that? Yep, I change it. I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in this circle. Now I went there to smoke. I went in with a lie. They did the ceremony and they never pray for themselves. When you have the pipe, you pray for everybody else but you. I pray for Patrick that this interview is great. I pray that he becomes greater than he is already. And if you have problems, God forbid you have problems with your wife or something, I hope Patrick's wife is healthy. And so I got to understand the religion a little bit and I got to respect it. I did it for five years. One of the guys in there said, Sammy, can I talk to you a minute? What? He says, you ain't an Indian. And I said, I know, bro. He said, we have Wicca. I said, what's Wicca? The witches and the whole thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you join us and pray with us a little bit to the goddess and the god? I said, all right, I'll do that too. I joined their group. I was Catholic growing up. So what I really, really found out, even a Muslim guy came to me and wanted to be join, become Muslim. I couldn't do that. I like pork, I'm not going to do it. So I turned around and I, what I understood is this. Everybody believes in God in one form or another. All the religions is nothing more than a road to God. The Jewish community has it. The Christians have it, the Catholics have it, the Indians have it. Everybody has that road to God. The Wicca people, they all have the God. It's The road is different, and we start arguing and fighting over it, but we all have the God. That's what it is. If you believe in God, it doesn't matter whether you believe a monkey. That's good. The guys I saw that found Jesus in prison, I've seen guys who found him. And they're usually crying and whining and asking him for less time and want to get out and do this, that, and the other thing. Or it's an excuse for something else. The devil made me do it. I didn't do this on my own. I mean, they would I would love, you know, this is what they would say if they were me. The devil made me do it. I found Jesus in prison and I became a holy roller and that's it. No, I would be lying through my teeth. And one thing God's going to do with me, I always said this, when I get up there, if I get up there, he's going to say one thing about you, Sammy. You're not a fucking phony or a liar. You tell it like you feel it. You did what you did, and whatever's going to be is going to be. But to start lying and crying, how are they going to face God? All them years of lying about Jesus. You didn't believe Jesus. Yeah, but I had to get out of prison. But now you got to face God. He's going to know you. you're full of shit. You, go on the express on that train over there. Get the fuck out of here. So, I don't know. No, that makes sense. I mean, it's, it's your testimony, but... Uh, are you following any of the Epstein stuff? Because I know he was in the same section as you and Suicide Watch. Yeah. What is Suicide Watch? Did he kill himself? Was well, he suicide? What do you think? I, I was in 9 South. There's another one. There's 10 South. Okay. 10 South is extremely secure. I don't know if he was in that. But he had another celly. 
at one point. So I don't think he was in 10 South. 10 South, you can't even breathe. The, when they give you your food, they, the guards can't feed you. They can't even open the slot. A lieutenant's got to come up and open the slot. If he's up there, I don't know how the fuck they would have killed him. And I, there's only one bunk, so I don't know how he would even hang himself. So he's probably on 9 South. It don't take long to kill yourself. I mean, if he hung himself, I don't believe anybody killed him. I think he knew it was over. And, and he was going to be tortured for his family and whatever, and he took himself out. Now, I don't know, they're gonna keep it going, see who else. Now, a lot of people, like Clinton, was with him, he said, two, three times, five times. On the flights, he's with him 26 times. We also know he's a fucking degenerate. So maybe those people take a deep breath. Ah, you know, don't take it personal, Clinton, wherever you are, that I'm calling you a degenerate, but you are what you are. And I'm a man, I understand, but when you hit a certain point, you gotta keep your zipper closed. You can't be fucking nailing a 21-year-old. She's old enough to know better, and I give you that. But still, you're in a position, tremendous position of power. But you're a douche. I don't even want to talk about you. Boxing, gambling. Did you guys ever do anything with Don King? Any contacts with Don King? Yes. I went in front of a grand jury. I was I was subpoenaed in front of a grand jury for boxing. When I was there, I was out with John Gotti. Mike Tyson was was the shit. Now I had another guy, and I can't think of his name. I knew the trainer, and I knew the black guy. I was training in the gym with him occasionally. He was a tough fighter, and he was a little bit over the hill. So I thought of a thing to set up a fight. I wanted him, and someday I'll get the name. I can't remember right now. But I'll get him to fight the champ in Italy. The champ in Italy was with two brothers who were both made guys in the mob. So I'm reaching them through the Italian people. I want this guy to come in and fight my guy, the black guy. And my guy will win, so he gets your belt. So if he wins and he has your belt, I want to hook up a fight with Mike Tyson, and I want big money because it's a champion. He's got a belt, you got a belt. The numbers are bigger. We know that Mike could probably beat you. Now, if the people around Mike want to make him duck a fight, I don't think he would do that. But then it's another story, but we never got that far. The Italian guy had to come here and fight a lesser opponent first before he fought my guy. And he lost to, to that guy. So now the thing is off. But in the process of all of this, John knows what's going on. I have a guy, it's a street guy, can't even think of his name, but he's going to Don King talking about a potential fight. He's not having a lot of luck. Don King stands up. He don't want it, no part of this thing. He mentions John Gotti, this, that. Now, fuck, I'm a, I'm, I'm a tough guy. I went to jail for this and that and that. Fuck John, I'm not doing any of that bullshit. So the kid comes back and tells him. So I said, John, forget the whole thing now. It ain't gonna work. He, he won't do it. Don King won't do what we want. Did you tell him to mention my name? Yeah, I did. He, he don't want to be bodied. He said he's a tough guy, he did time. Really? Yeah. Tell the kid to go back, make another appointment, and kill him. You want me to kill Don King? No, not you. The kid, this guy. You want me to tell this kid to go back and kill Don King? Yeah, well, hit him with a proposal. If he says no, take a gun out and shoot him. All right, that's what you want? Yeah, all right. I grabbed the kid. <laughs> he wasn't the kid, man. He's a guy, you know, it was tough. Listen, you're gonna go, you're gonna hit him with this proposal. If he says no and gives you that shit, I'm a tough guy. Take the gun out and shoot him. Shoot him right in the head. Kill him. You want me to kill Don King? <laughs> I said, it's not me. John wants you to kill him. What do you want me to tell you? You gotta kill him. He took off. <laughs> the kid took off. I'd never seen hide a hair of him again. He must have left the country. I don't know where the fuck he went. He took off. So we never went after Don King because I'm, I didn't want, I'm definitely not going after him because this is insane now. We're hitting the guy because he don't want to do a deal. <laughs> we'll be hitting guys every other week. <laughs> so the hit was given, but the hit wasn't made. It wasn't completed because right. the guy ran off. The guy took off. <laughs> Sammy, I've heard a lot of stories with, you know, what happened with John F. Kennedy and the involvement of mafia, you know, and I've heard so many different stories. What do you know about what happened with John F. Kennedy? I don't really know. There's so many people who, who are possible candidates for that. But to make it into a shorter story, the FBI, when I had cooperated, came to me and one of the I was in Quantico, and they said, there's guys gonna come down to you and ask you some really high-level questions. 
I said, all right. They came down, a bunch of guys in suits. And they said, the same thing you said. What do you know about Kennedy? Is that it? Yeah. From what I understand, you guys should know. You guys participated in this hit. It wasn't a mafia dude on that grassy hill. You people, whoa, 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 scrub this. And they all left. John Kennedy was good. He was with the mob. He did everything he was asked to, and then some. His father was a bootlegger. They were with us. All the Kennedys have dirty laundry. Bobby Kennedy couldn't stand the fact that the mafia helped make him win the election. He went to war with the mob. He went to war with Jimmy Hoffa. He went to war with the head of the FBI, Hoover. He went to war with everybody. He made so many enemies from a guy that was loved, John Kennedy, and the father who was respected was a bootlegger, and they were living up to their word. There are so many enemies, who knows? Rumor has it that there's a whole concoction mixed with them all, but I don't know. For sure, I have no idea for, for in a positive way. Just what I hear from rumors and stuff like that. Last thing here is speed round. I'll give you a name. Tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. One word that comes to your mind. Philip Leonetti. Good guy. Comey. Schema. Gotti Jr. He didn't belong. Joe Colucci. Good guy made bad decisions. Trump. If one word is not even fair, because the only word I could actually think of, he has so many things on both sides, but he's the president of the United States, period. Like him, dislike him, it's not your call. Sonny Francis. Good stand-up guy. Gotti Sr. A tremendous disappointment. Albert Krieger. A highly educated asshole. Frank Kelly. Signs were that he was really a good guy. Assistant Attorney General Linda Lacewell. As a reward for finding me guilty and going for this upward departure, they offered her a smorgasbord. That's all she needed. And she probably ate everything. Fat fuck. Richard Kuklinski. Is that the Iceman? Yes. There isn't even a word for this piece of shit. I would like to go to wherever he's buried, dig him up, and shoot him right in his fucking skull of his head. Piece of shit, liar. Hoffa. He wanted the union back after he came out, he couldn't get it. Bad decision on his part. Sammy, final thoughts here with uh, what you're working on right now with the book and the podcast. You said it's a podcast that will be coming out, hopefully soon, not too long from now, maybe a month, a couple of months, who knows. But it's gonna be me talking to people, other, ex-gangsters, agents, and myself talking about my life from soup to nuts, including this conversation now. So this isn't just you, this is you talking with other people as guests as well on the show. Right. Very interesting. Final thoughts, Sammy. You haven't done this for quite some time since April 16th, you know, 20 some years ago. The world's watching right now. This is gonna get a lot of views. This is gonna create a lot of conversations. What are your final thoughts? After every negative thing that was said about me and all the lies, I'm amazed how many good people talk to me, deal with me, trust me from different businesses. I know that they're a little afraid when they first start, but once they get to know me, like my neighbors and people I'm doing business with all over the place, I have a tremendous, warm, trusting relationship. And it amazes me. After all the bullshit I went through, there's a world full of real good fucking people. And I'm amazed by that. I'm enjoying that part of my life. I love my ex-wife to death. She's my soulmate. She's not my wife anymore, but she's my soulmate. My daughter, my son, my grandchildren. If you could find something really pleasant after all of this shit, which I did, and I still do every day, and if I die tomorrow, this fulfilled me for all the pain and suffering I went through and for everything I did and went through. This made me whole again. It made me feel good about myself and about everybody around me. And I know there's people who will call themselves victims and say something. All you so-called victims, you're, you weren't a victim when your father or your brother or whoever was around and he was running around with me and killing people. That don't bother you. What bothers you is that I was part of killing them. 
I was part of their life. Now, there could be a situation, and I tell my daughter and my ex-wife and my son, if I die tomorrow, this was my choice, my life. Don't be mad at anybody. Be mad at me, I broke the rules. Don't be mad at the person who comes, if they ever come, period. No regrets. Very few, very few. I mean, of course, like a human being, everybody who wants to play Monday quarterback, is there things that I would do differently? Without a doubt. I still respect the life. I think that the people are left that are around now, that are in Goza Nostra, the mafia, are doing the right thing. They're curbing themselves and curbing their appetite. They're using their head and they're acting like Goza Nostra should have acted, maybe in my era. My era was different. And the eras before that, it was like the Jesse James days. It was a different ball game. You are using your head and you're, you're a tremendous example of quality goes in Austria. Stay away from killing, from all of that bullshit. Do your little bullshit petty crimes. There's not 50 million agents on your back. As soon as you start killing and doing stupid shit, then you're gonna wear these people around your neck. You'll become a target again. And I can guarantee you, I've been with them for a while. And then I also met, you know, everybody, I, I don't like to come. I already met a lot, a lot of agents that are really, really good people. Strong, solid, good people. Guys retired, still call me today, years later. How you doing, Sammy? How's this? How's that? How's Deb? How's, I mean, they don't have to do that. I know we went back and forth talking about trying to make this work. You know, thank you for making this work and being willing to we pretty much went through every question that we had. I mean, there was no holding back on the questions. So you were willing to be asked any of the questions. And if you're watching this, you want to find out more about any of Sammy's podcasts or projects coming up. We're going to put the links below in the description. Sammy, again, thank you for making the time to come out and be a guest on Value Tainment. Appreciate you. It's my pleasure. You've been a pleasure, too. I hope you enjoyed this exclusive interview with Sammy DeBull Carvano. Obviously, there's a lot of technical details in the making of this interview, a lot of back and forth, but eventually we were able to make this work. But I want to hear your thoughts. I actually want to hear if your opinion changed about him for the better, for the worse. Are you in the same place? Some of the stories that stuck with you, what stories were made to stick where you're thinking about it right now, two hours after watching this interview? So either comment your thoughts below or tweet me directly at Patrick Bed David. That's my handle on Twitter. I will respond back and I will see most of the comments on Twitter because those are directed to, uh, towards me. And then on top of that, if you enjoy these interviews, these mob interviews, we have many of them. A couple of them I want you to watch that you may be interested in. One of them is with the real life Donnie Brasco. Do you remember the movie Donnie Brasco? The real life Donnie Brasco is Joe Pistone. We spent a few hours together. He doesn't do a lot of live interviews. And one of the parts, I asked him a question, I said, you know, was there ever a time you were about to become a made man, you're undercover FBI for six years, did you ever get to the point where you didn't want to come back to your regular life? And you have to see the answer to see if you believe his response to it or not. And the other interview is with Frank Collada. Frank Collada was the hitman for Tony Spilatra in Las Vegas. If you've seen the movie Casino, it's pretty much around his life and what they did. So this is another interview to watch. He moved with Spilatra from Chicago to Las Vegas, and they ran pretty much all of Las Vegas together. Another one to watch. So if you got any thoughts, comment below or tweet me directly. And if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do so. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.